a shipwreck in the Greek islands. Hundreds of people fight for survival in a swirling storm. With their lives on the line, some people become heroes. Others do whatever it takes to stay alive. Keep her away! She'll kill us both! Investigators uncover an extraordinary chain of events. Small mistakes which have deadly consequences. Mayday, mayday! We're doing 90 miles an hour! Out of control! Take a life jacket! Where's the cross guard? A passenger ferry pushes its way through a storm. What is that? Whoa! Oh my God! Within sight of land, this Greek island's ferry is sinking in high winds and stormy seas. There was a hole, and it was going to sink, and it was going to sink fast. A huge rescue operation kicks in. Rescuers must risk their own lives. I never want to be in that situation ever again because it was terrifying. But I had enough time to think, OK, well, this is the part where I die. It was like a catastrophe. It was as if it was coming the end of the world for this island. For the people of Greece, it's a national disaster, the worst of its kind in 30 years. Discovering why it happened will take months of detective work and raise this question. How safe are the ships we sail on? the Greek capital, Athens. This great metropolis has a 3,000-year history, a history built around the city's easy access to the Mediterranean. The harbor district of Athens is called Piraeus. Ferry boats ply back and forth between here and the more than 200 islands scattered throughout the Aegean Sea. For island hoppers, this is where the adventure begins. Tuesday, September the 26th, 2000. Christine Shannon and Heidi Hart from Seattle are close friends. They've bought tickets for a ferry ride to the island of Paros, 166 kilometers to the southeast. Express, Samina? Express, Express sounds good. How long is it? Christine's 32 and teaches preschool. Heidi's 26 and just graduated from college. She wants to go into business management. It's been a crazy kind of day. They planned on going to the island of Santorini, further south. I have it. OK, let's go. Oh, we have hurry. Now, I have the tickets. Oh, let's go. We'd been enjoying Athens the night before a little too much, and we overslept and missed our Santorini boat. I had never heard of Paros. I even asked them, well, show me on a map where the island is. And then I said, never mind, it doesn't matter. Let's just go. It's the next boat. Let's go somewhere. So it was a fluke that we were on that boat. Here's where chance is steering them. It could be a whole lot worse. If you dream of a Greek getaway, Paros is just what the guidebooks promise. Life is laid back, and the backdrop is enchanting. Around 12,000 people live on Paros year-round. In tourist season, add to that 100,000 visitors. Ferries from Athens head for the harbor in the main town, Parikia. There's constant traffic back and forth to the mainland. As one boat's leaving, another one shows up, bringing hundreds more eager visitors. Christine and Heidi are among 472 passengers who board the Samina today. As they get ready to embark, one thing becomes clear. 
Some of the boats on the island's run are modern, newly built. But the Semina comes from a different era. She's been crisscrossing the Mediterranean since 1966. The Semina was launched before these two were born. And though they don't realize it, Greek safety laws say that in little over a year, the Semina will be pulled out of service and sent to the scrapyard. I made a few jokes to Christine about uh, the lifeboats don't look very safe if we get into trouble out here. I said, we'll be screwed. And I said, well, there's no icebergs in the Aegean, so we should be OK. The Semina can carry more than 1,000 passengers, along with her 61 crew. So today, the ship's less than half full. <laughs> Katrina Stark and her cousin Sarah Davis, both from New Zealand, are backpacking. Like Heidi and Christine, they're literally sailing into the unknown. We had no plans. We went to get on the very first ferry that was leaving, going wherever it was going to take us, and that happened to be first stop Paris. At 7.15, two hours into the journey, the sun is setting. There are still three hours to kill before the Semina arrives. The sports fans on board, passengers and crew, know just how they'd like to spend the time. There's a major soccer game playing live on TV. Athens star side Panathinaikos are up against their German rivals, Hamburg. The reception wasn't very good, and so they had various staff come along trying to fix the TV, and everyone was putting suggestions for how to fix the TV, and it seemed to be quite important to everybody on board that they get to see this game. At 8 p.m., the Samina passes the island of Kithnos. They're on schedule to reach Paros at around a quarter past 10. The wind is rising, the sea is growing rougher, but these northerly winds, known as the Meltemi, are frequent at this time of year. The Samina has weathered conditions much worse than this over the past three decades. I'm gonna take a nap! Heidi and Christine are the only people left outside. They think their tickets don't allow them to go in. I said, we have third class tickets, we have to stay out on the deck. It's gonna be a cold, wet, terrible night. But I didn't even think to go downstairs where most of the people on the boat were. For the crew of the Semina, the nighttime journey is routine. Hazards such as reefs and rocks are all clearly marked on their charts. Many have warning lights. Two jagged outcrops rise from the sea within sight of the main harbor on Paros, Parikia Bay. Known as the Portes, or the Gates, they lie five and a half kilometers from the town. For every mariner sailing these waters, the Gates of Paros are a familiar landmark. They're welcoming, but dangerous too. The rocks rise 25 meters out of the sea. Every passing ship must give them a wide clearance. At night, a beacon light on the taller of the two rocks sends a clear warning to sailors. Stray too close to the gates of Paros and disaster will follow. They're still two hours away. but they're sailing into a growing storm. Despite the weather, Christine and Heidi are still out in the open. <laughs> Had I known we could go to any other part of the boat at that point in time, I would have, but I didn't know. And actually being in that part of the boat, I think was very fortuitous for us because we, we were able to be aware of what was going on later. Being out on the deck will help save their lives. Soon, everyone aboard will be fighting for survival. On the evening of September the 26th, 2000, 
The passenger ferry Express Samina leaves Athens harbor Piraeus, heading southeast. She's making for the island of Paros, five hours away in the Aegean Sea. As the sun sets, the weather deteriorates until by nightfall the ship is being buffeted by a northerly gale. But the crew are used to such conditions. Their ship is big enough, tough enough to survive far worse. The Samina is 115 meters long, more than a soccer field, and 18 meters wide. Passengers are widely dispersed. Heidi and Christine are out on the open deck. Katrina and Sarah are inside the main passenger lounge. The nerve center is here, the engine room. It's below the waterline, but is protected by a series of watertight doors. The crew need to move about, but the ship is safe so long as they lock the doors tight behind them. To reduce the rolling effect of the waves, the ship also has a stabilizing system, like small wings that extend out into the water. It's still a bumpy ride, but it doesn't stop passengers moving about when they want to. As we got further away and night began to fall, the seas got rougher and it became stormy until it got to the point where you couldn't even walk on board, you had to kind of stumble sideways. <laughs> People were kind of laughing. It was kind of funny at the time. Being from a place where we ride ferries quite often, it wasn't really a concern to us at the time, but it was pretty rough out there. It's 10 p.m. The wind has now risen to nearly 50 kilometers an hour. Waves are cresting two meters high. Despite the gale, visibility is good. Those are the lights of Paros. The Samina's on time and still pushing forward at 33 kilometers an hour. Then suddenly, the ship lurches sharply to the left. What's that? I don't know. The boat turned enough that it startled me awake. And I woke up and was kind of dazed a little bit. You can't just park a boat like you're parking a car. And so I thought it was odd that I felt this g-force of the boat turning. Christine said, hey, there's lights. I see shore. We must be getting pretty close to docking. The lights of Parikia, even car headlights, are clearly visible just five and a half kilometers away. But then another light cuts through the darkness. This rock just comes out of nowhere, just out of the black night. And I'll never forget what it looks like in my mind. It was, you know, this brown, kind of craggly, sandish looking rock that had lights on top of it shining down, so it illuminated it. And it, it just, it made it look like a movie set. The side of the boat scraped along the side. I could have walked over and touched it. And you could hear down in the lower decks of the boat that the metal was just ripping apart. The unthinkable has happened. The Samina has crashed against the gates of Paros. One million kilos of ship grind against the rocks. It was the worst sound and it was the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. It sounded like fingernails on the chalkboard, just God's fingernail on the biggest chalkboard in the world. There was a hole and it was gonna sink and it was gonna sink fast. The shock wave reverberates through the ship. Suddenly there was a big lurch to the right side of the boat and people who were standing up got thrown off their feet. Everything in the bar smashed. I looked out the window and there were two large rocks went past that looked white, lit up by the light inside the ship. I don't know what that was. Oh, man, it just doesn't sound good, you know? In a situation like this, the time frame is so hard to put back together. But it, it seemed like maybe a minute or two until the boat started to noticeably lilt to the side and, and tip. And that's kind of when the chaos started. Get out of this boat. Get out of this boat. 
Crying, lots of people were praying, holding on to each other, yelling. There was no alarm or siren. There was no one to tell us what we were supposed to do. We need to get off this boat and we need to leave right now. We don't have to panic. Christine said to me, the Titanic took hours to sink. And I said, we don't have that much time. We don't have hours, Christine. We need to leave now. Okay, okay, okay. In my mind, I thought, this boat's going to sink and we're all going to die. All these people trying to get life jacket. Being taller, I was able to reach over the heads of most people who were trying to get hold of life jackets and grab two. The Samina has 61 crew members, but where are they? Passengers must fend for themselves. So I yelled to Christine, come here, I think I found life best. Hey, just open up, just take it off. At this point, people were starting to run past us. Please, please, sir. And I was saying, here, take these, and throwing them out, and people were just panicking. Within minutes of the collision, the ship's lights go out. Passengers are plunged into darkness until emergency generators kick in. And then the first flare went off. This eerie red glow coming down over the ferry gave it a whole nother feeling of just terror that we're out in the night, in the dark, and the ferry's gonna sink. At the harbor, port officials are now aware of the developing crisis. Port Authority Vice Commander Dimitrios Malamas starts to organize a rescue. He needs all available boats right now. What vessels do we have in the area? Alexis Bisbas runs a yacht charter business in Parikia. The first I heard of the disaster was a phone call that I got from the port police at about 10.15. Can I get out there with my boat as quickly as possible? just to help with whatever might be necessary. And there was no way that we had any idea that it was going to be a disaster of that magnitude. Paros has a medical center equipped for the islanders' basic needs, not a major disaster. Dr. John Polizoides was an ER surgeon for 35 years. Though retired, he helps run the center. We saw a ship was going down and there were a lot of boats and lights and so on. We did, I personally did not expect anything tragic to come out of that because you are so close also to the harbor. Aboard the Samina, many of the 472 passengers are in a state of sheer terror. It was chaos. It was people not knowing what to do and waiting for a captain or a crew to help us. There was a woman who went through the door just before us and she, as soon as she got out onto the deck, she climbed over the railings and just jumped off, like didn't look back or didn't say anything to anybody and just climbed over and threw herself off into the water. There was people holding children over the railings, wanting to throw them down to people in the water. It was, it was quite a terrible scene. The wind hampers efforts to abandon ship. They were releasing inflatable life rafts. They weren't attached to the ship, so as soon as it was released, it was in a big storm, it would get picked up by the wind as soon as it was inflated, and they were just blowing halfway to Athens. The rafts blow beyond the reach of many passengers who've already leapt into the sea. <laughs> in the confusion, Heidi Hart is knocked flying, striking her head. I kept thinking, if I black out now, you know, I'm done for. This boat's sinking. I have to stay conscious. I had this adrenaline rush, and there was, I mean, a feeling that I would call terror. I mean, I knew instantly this was going to be a, a fight for our lives. 
there was some point in time where I literally felt myself leave my body and instincts kicked in. Everybody was running to the rear of the boat and Christine just looked at me and said, go that way to the front of the boat. And she said, but nobody's up there. It was the darkest part of the boat. It was very, it was the highest part of the boat. She said, nobody's up there. I said, I don't care, go. And luckily for us, that's where we found a lifeboat hanging over the side of the ship. Heidi and Christine have escaped the sinking ship, but they're still at the mercy of the storm. When we jumped into the lifeboat, it wasn't orderly, here's your seat, it was jump. Where you land is where you are, and so we were just kind of all pig-piled in this lifeboat together. The battle for survival takes an ugly turn. Each passenger must decide, help others, or fend for themselves. There was five or six men in the back of the boat, and they were fighting with each other. They were yelling at each other. They, as the ferry was sinking, they kept pointing at the ferry and fighting with each other. And, and then, you know, this is when I see the guy swimming up to the boat, and I, so I started getting ready. I'm thinking, OK, I, I need a rope. i got to throw him something. He has no life vest on. The only thing you could see was his eyes and his nose coming out of the water, and he was just barely making it, swimming towards us. Everybody else on the boat was yelling, no, no, we can't take any more people on. I've got you, don't worry. I've got you. Now Heidi leaned over and grabbed this gentleman's hand, and I reached over and grabbed her by the waist, and she told me I'm not letting go, and I yelled to the other people, she's not letting go. He had taken off almost all of his clothes. He was wearing just his underwear. I mean, I'm not a very big person. I'm five feet tall. Just me trying to pull him in the boat wasn't going to work. The men in the lifeboat realize that Heidi won't let go and finally help haul the drowning man on board. I don't know what they were thinking. They were panicking. So, I mean, who am I to judge what the other, what other people were thinking and doing, but there was a lot more that could have been done that night. Of the 533 people who set out on the Samina, many are now in the sea. Others are still trapped on the vessel itself. The ship begins to roll over. If it goes down, dozens of people will be dragged down with it. The passenger ferry Express Samina has struck rocks near the island of Paros in the Aegean Sea. 533 passengers and crew face a battle to survive in high winds and stormy seas. Some people have managed to clamber into a lifeboat. Others have stayed with the ship and now fear it will sink beneath them. At that stage we were on the deck trying to figure out whether it was a good idea to jump overboard as well. Um, but we were tilting further and further, and it was getting to the point where we didn't really have that choice anymore. It's 10.50, 40 minutes after the collision. Sarah! Are you looking at me? As the Samina continues to roll, Katrina Stark has little choice. She hauls herself over the rail. The ship has turned completely on its side. Katrina is sitting on the hull. Should she try to swim for shore or wait for rescue? While I was sitting there thinking about that, all of a sudden, the ship just sank underneath us and sucked us down and everything around it. I, like, I don't know how much time we were under the water but I had enough time to think, okay, well, this is the part where I die. This is the part where I drown. I kind of thought, well, okay, that's fine. And had enough time to be okay with that. Just as we got there, we saw the ferry sinking, um, which was an extreme sight. And to see this entire ship sink beneath the waves and to be gone, and just leave us in our little lifeboat 
it, it was it was amazing. It was almost beautiful in a sad sort of way. And then complete blackness, darkness, huge waves. <sighs> The Samina sinks two and a half kilometers from the gates of Paros. Even without its engines, wind, waves, and the ship's own momentum carry the Samina closer to the shore. The sea here is 38 meters deep. As the Samina goes down, huge bubbles of air escape from the ship, making the water less dense, making objects in the water sink more quickly. Katrina Stark sinks several meters before the buoyancy of her life jacket pulls her up again. As suddenly as I had been sucked under, suddenly I popped out the top. Her priority now is to find her cousin, Sarah. In the storm, she can't tell where she is. The waves were so big that for one second it sounded like she was over there, and so I tried to swim that way, and then the next second it sounded like, oh, she's over there, I tried to swim that way. Eventually I just said to her, okay, make sure that you get on a boat and get back to land and I will see you back on shore. At 11.15 p.m., Dr. Polizoides receives his first casualty of the night, but something doesn't add up. They brought a man on a stretcher. He was semi-conscious. And then we started working on him. He had hardly any blood pressure. And when we were resuscitating him, I realized that he was dry, uh, which it meant that he didn't actually, he was not from the ship. Anyway, we carried on. Eventually, we lost him. He died in our hands. And then people came and he said, you know who it, who it was? And I said, no. His patient isn't from the Samina, but the disaster still claims its first victim. The man is Dimitrios Malamas, who'd been helping organize the rescue. In the crisis, he'd suffered a heart attack. He was 40 years old. So you can understand, even at this early stage, although we did not know the number of people that we were going to lose, there was that sense of tragedy immediately from the very beginning. A local shopkeeper, George Scandalis, grabs his video camera and captures these first raw images as survivors begin to appear. As soon as we got close enough to shore and when I saw this white cathedral with the blue dome top, that was when I finally knew we made it. We're going to get to shore. We're going to be alive. I felt more alive than I've ever felt in my life. Giddy, almost giddy. And actually afterwards, one of the things that I had to come to terms with was that people died and I felt so alive. One of the local fishing boats now appears, crowded with people who've been dragged from the sea. Local boat owner Alexis Bisbas is part of the rescue flotilla searching for survivors. One minute we were flying across the top of a wave, the next minute we were burying the bow of the boat into the previous wave. We had water coming across the decks. I've been sailing all my life. I've never had a situation like that. I never want to be in that situation ever again because it was terrifying. He plucks 25 people from the sea in three trips out into the stormy waters. One of the amazing things in these situations is the way that people behave. A young man we pulled out who's still carrying his portable stereo system. So the one hand's trying to grab hold of the boat and the other hand, as we realized, was being hampered by this stereo system that he still had in his other hand. One of them was an old lady who had tied to her life jacket her bag. As we were trying to drag her into the boat, we realized that something was stopping her. And I went to cut her free of this bag. And she said to us that if we did, we should throw her back because that was her entire life in this bag. 
Many survivors are in a state of shock. All are cold, wet, and exhausted. Just a few hundred meters away, dozens of people are still in the water, trying to stay alive until they're spotted by a rescue boat. Katrina Stark and a fellow survivor, a total stranger, are now clinging desperately to a piece of wreckage. My first surprise about being in the water was that it was warm. I was really expecting the water to be cold. They were big waves and you just had to cling on tight to the piece of wreckage. Not too far away from us was an older Greek woman who couldn't swim. And she was panicking and was screaming and yelling, trying to get someone to come and save her. And the guy that I was with was saying, she's gonna to want to come over to us and if she grabs hold of us, she's gonna drag us down. Keep her away, she'll kill us both, Brianna. She had kind of wild eyes, like she was clearly panicking. And a big wave came um, and washed over her and she didn't come back up out of the water. She had drowned. There are still some signs of hope. Some people have been pushed south by the wind. Miraculously avoiding being smashed onto the rocks, they've wound up on a sandy beach, the Bay of St. Irene. A life raft beaches in the same spot. They're safe now, but the terror these little children have gone through is hard to comprehend. More than 400 survivors have now wound up on the dockside. Many have suffered a terrifying ordeal in the water. They're rushed to the medical center where Dr. Polizoides has now assembled a team of 15 medics. Some doctors and nurses based on the island, others tourists who've come in to assist. Between 11, 30 and 12, the first drowned uh, was brought in on a stretcher. And although I worked for 35 years as an accident surgeon, it was uh, a horrible experience. And that was the beginning of the horrific feeling which I had that this is serious now. At midnight, after an hour in the water, Katrina Stark is brought to shore. We were the last people that they were able to bring up onto the boat. And they headed back for the harbour. Um, and on the way, they stopped a couple of times to um, pick people up, but they would go to pick them up and realise that they were dead, and so they'd just leave them where they were. Katrina doesn't know if her cousin made it. Sarah? Katrina? I was just never been so happy to see anybody in my whole life. And I just grabbed hold of her and wouldn't leave her side for a second. So happy to see you. Oh, yeah. How are you doing? Are you keeping warm? Yeah. It was terrifying. I mean, it's been five years since the accident, and I still have nightmares. I still think about it. It will still make me cry. You guys have had quite a shock being in the water. It was traumatic and it was very scary, but it was also a singularly defining moment in my life where I was able to use all of the resources I had to survive. I think we've got them. Pull, 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 pull. I don't think I would have chosen not to live through this. At half past midnight, more than two hours after the collision, the rescue operation is becoming more and more a search for bodies. When you start seeing the bodies in the sea, somebody that I knew that an hour ago they were breathing, and suddenly they're dead, and they're... And it was very distressing. I mean, it took me a very long time to put it out of my mind. 
um, it was very difficult. 25 people are now confirmed dead. As victims continue to arrive, Dr. Polizoides is overwhelmed. Do I go to this room and try and save someone? Do I wait and, and see whether it's worth saving? And it was like a catastrophe. It was as if it was coming the end of the world for, to this island. So it was almost like you're seeing a movie that's not happening to you. Every half an hour, the number of bodies increased. By 2.30 a.m., the number of dead reaches 60. There's no room for so many bodies in the medical center. The Church of St. Nicholas on the waterfront now becomes a temporary morgue. The search for people, alive or dead, continues right through the night. Very soon, investigators will begin to ask tough questions. Who's to blame for the sinking? Why did so many people have to die? The passenger ferry Express Samina has sunk in a storm in the Aegean Sea. Already 60 people are confirmed dead. Many more need medical treatment. Morning reveals the power of last night's storm. A lifeboat lies smashed to pieces on the rocks. Life rafts blew away, empty. A message board at the harbour front lists who's alive and who's still missing. Bodies will continue to wash up on the beaches for days to come. There aren't enough coffins on Paros. More arrive. Even the most experienced professionals are touched by the trauma. I was so shaken by this that I didn't sleep for two nights. And on the third night where I went to sleep, I dreamed that my son was drowning. Very quickly, the grief turns to anger. Where were the crew when the ship hit the rocks? Where were they when the passengers needed help? Rumors spread like wildfire and are picked up by the media. Were some members of the crew watching the soccer game on TV when they should have been steering the ship? The captain, 53-year-old Vasilis Yanakos, is held for questioning by the police. On Paros, the funerals begin. Here, a four-year-old boy drowned with his father. Divers discover 10 bodies trapped inside the hull of the Samina. The last body is found floating two weeks after the sinking, 50 kilometers north of Paros. Altogether, 80 people have died, 75 passengers, five crew members. This is Greece's worst shipping disaster in more than 30 years a national tragedy. In the bitter aftermath, the spotlight falls on the company which owned the Samina and its vice president, Pantelis Sfinias. He could face criminal charges as well as multi-million dollar compensation claims. Two months after the sinking, police surround a body lying on the sidewalk outside company headquarters in Athens. Sfinias has jumped out of his sixth floor window committing suicide. Maritime experts at the National Technical University of Athens begin an inquiry. Detailed testimony is gathered from 46 crew members, as well as 192 passengers. The Greek legal authorities want the university to give them a thorough explanation of what happened. Professor David Molyneux of the National Research Centre of Canada is one of the world's leading experts on ferry safety. He's studied the findings of the Greek investigators who came up with a startling realisation. What they found at the inquiry defied some of the initial speculation concerning the age of the ship, and the accident, in fact, turned out to be caused by something completely different. Testimony reveals each small but critical factor that together turn a routine ferry crossing into a national disaster. Three hours into the journey, the crew switch on the ship's autopilot. 
The autopilot is an electronic link between the compass and the rudder, correcting the rudder a little bit one way or the other to bring you back where you want to be. Even on autopilot, a crew member should constantly monitor the ship's position. It's bad practice to leave an autopilot unattended, particularly in bad weather, because the wind, the waves and the current are all acting to drift the ship in one direction. And that kind of steady drift is not compensated for by the electronics in the autopilot. As the weather grows worse, the crew deploy the ship's stabilizer system to make the ride more comfortable for the passengers. The stabilizer uses two small fins to counteract the roll of the ship. But something extraordinary has happened. Only the starboard or right hand stabilizer fin has extended. Very unusual. Normally we'd expect both stabilizers to be working at any one time. With just one stabilizer, the ship is no longer symmetrical. So the flow around the ship is unbalanced. And as a result, the ship will tend to drift one way rather than go in a straight line. With only the starboard stabilizer, the Samina is pulled slowly but surely to the right. It's a deadly malfunction. Captains aim to stay at least 740 meters left of the gates of Paros. But when the Samina arrives, she's on collision course. A crew member makes a last minute attempt to steer the ship to the left. But the ship can't turn quickly enough. It was very unfortunate the ship got a hold, but there was really no reason why the ship should have sank. The damage was within the range that you would normally expect a ship to survive. The east face of the taller pinnacle is where the ship strikes, at 12 minutes past 10 p.m. There's a six meter lengthways gash, as long as a telephone pole, and one meter wide. But this hole is well above the waterline. No water should enter the ship. Moments later, a second impact. The stabilizer fin bends backwards. It stabs like a dagger through the ship's side. This three meter gash is below the waterline. Even worse, it's exactly alongside the engine room. The main generators are knocked out. Electrical power is cut throughout the ship. The investigating team orders divers to make a detailed survey of the wreck of the Samina. Inside, they discover the final piece of the puzzle. Even with two large holes, the ship could have been saved. One final error sealed the fate of the Samina. The passenger ferry Express Samina strikes rocks near the Greek island of Paros. With two gaping holes in her starboard side, she capsizes and sinks in 38 meters of water. Divers go down to survey the wreck and make a startling discovery. Like all large seagoing ships, the Samina is divided into separate compartments, sealed by watertight doors like this one. Safety laws insist they remain locked while the ship's at sea. On the Samina's last journey, some of the doors were open. If you imagine in your house, every time you went through a door from the kitchen, you had to close it, lock it, move on to the living room, open that door, close it, lock it, and carry on. It really does slow down your everyday life. So there is a tendency sometimes to leave these doors open. Because they're left open, water is no longer confined to the engine room. And now that the power is cut, the crew can't close the doors remotely. Okay. 29 of the crew are called back for a second grilling by investigators. This testimony provides an exact picture of the ship's last moments, data which is now built into a computer model. At 10.15, three minutes after the collision, the ship is listing only five degrees to the right. 
but filling fast through that hole in the engine room. By 10.25, she's listing 14 degrees. Now the six meter gash, which was above the waterline, is exposed to the sea. This is the point where the Samina and 80 of those on board are doomed. The ship can't withstand this degree of damage. The Samina is what's called a Roro ferry. It stands for roll on, roll off. This is a modern Roro ship. Vehicles simply reverse in through the stern doors and then drive out at their destination. It's a cost-effective design with a potentially fatal flaw. The worst shipping disasters in recent times have involved vessels designed this way. The Herald of Free Enterprise went down with the loss of 193 lives at Zeebrugge in Belgium in 1987. 850 were drowned aboard the Roro ferry Estonia in the Baltic Sea in 1994. Unlike a cruise ship or a cargo vessel, which are divided into many smaller compartments, the vehicle deck of a Roro ship is one large open area, highly vulnerable to rapid flooding. Imagine comparing flooding an egg box with flooding just an empty cardboard shoe box. The shoe box would tend to fill up very, very quickly, whereas an egg box would tend to fill up each compartment at a time, and so the egg box would stay afloat, whereas the shoe box wouldn't. This open space is especially vulnerable because it's so close to the waterline. The car deck on a Roro ferry is low to make driving the vehicles on and off easy. As a result, you're relying on those watertight compartments to keep the ship afloat in the event of damage. By 10.29, the Samina is listing 23 degrees. She's now tilting so much that it's impossible to launch more lifeboats. Only three of the eight she carried got away. Three minutes later at 10.32, she's listing 33 degrees. At around 10.50, the ship turns completely on her side. We know the exact time that the ship sank because the clock on the bridge was stopped at two minutes past 11. Divers surveying the wreck make their most important discovery. Of the ship's 11 watertight doors, nine were left open. And the most important aspect of this accident was leaving the watertight doors open. As a result, the ship flooded, lost all its reserve of buoyancy, and eventually sank. If the doors had been locked, despite the navigational error which put the ship on the rocks, despite the hole in the engine room, this would probably have been a survivable accident. The trial of ship's captain Vasilis Yanakos and seven others began in May 2005, more than four years after the disaster. The sinking of the Samina led to safety improvements. Greece cut the maximum working life of passenger ferries from 35 to 30 years. The tragedy also helped speed the introduction of voyage recorders, like an airplane black box. They're now mandatory in all passenger ferries. Some good came out of bad. A thousand meters above the frigid North Sea, disaster strikes. A helicopter is crippled in the middle of a sudden storm. The pilots struggle for control as it sinks helplessly towards the sea. They're far from land, off the radar screens. No one knows exactly where they are. In the days that follow, investigators search for the truth hidden in this tangled wreck. The cause of the crash shocks those involved and reveals a hidden danger that reaches far beyond the North Sea. The need for oil 
drives men to some of the most unpleasant places on Earth. This is one of them. The North Sea divides Britain from mainland Europe. It's a shallow sea, and the cruel winds that race across it can whip up enormous waves. The sea is cold, grey, and violent. But there's oil out here, and so dozens of drilling platforms and thousands of men must face whatever the weather throws at them. The only efficient way to get the men out there is by helicopter. The flights are rough and long, up to 500 kilometers each way. After years, the trip has become largely routine, the danger below forgotten by many. What was that? But on a cold January morning in 1995, 18 men flying over the North Sea were faced with a horrible question. Mayday, 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 tail rotus failure, ditching. Could they survive in this extremely hostile environment? Oh, God. <laughs> January the 19th, 1995. Commander Seb Roberts and First Officer Lionel Soule work for Bristow Helicopters in Aberdeen, Scotland. Their job slide, is to ferry the oil workers out Just... to the oil platforms in the North Sea. By mid-morning, they've completed one trip already and are getting ready to head back out. Their helicopter is Super Puma 56 Charlie. While it's being checked out and refueled, Flight Officer Soule checks the flight logs and Commander Roberts goes through the weather reports, which are updated every two hours. Oh, weather's okay. Good for January. This is where they're heading, the North Sea. The discovery of oil here in the 1960s was a shot in the arm for the British economy. Brent crude, as the oil is known, is a light, sweet crude, ideal for turning into gasoline. And its price is a benchmark on the international oil market. It helped turn Aberdeen, the Scottish port city closest to the oil rigs, into a boom town, the European oil capital. All the leading oil companies have offices here. The city is focused on getting the black gold ashore. Because the rigs are so far offshore and the weather so unpredictable, helicopters are the only way to reliably ferry workers back and forth. Hundreds of thousands of people make the trip every year. The Super Pumas are one of the workhorses of the North Sea oil industry. Used around the world by industry and military, they're durable, tough, and made to withstand the elements. There are more of these helicopters flying offshore here than anywhere else in the world. The passengers heading to the platforms today gather in the heliport's departure lounge. They all work for the Texas company, Marathon Oil. The North Sea has scores of oil fields. They're divided up between several countries, including England and Norway. The governments then sell the rights to drill to a variety of oil companies. Marathon operates three platforms in the so-called Bray field, Bray East, Bravo, and Alpha. North Sea oil platforms are like cities that never sleep. They stand on the seabed, held up by enormous legs made of either metal or concrete. Below each one, pipes snake out to the seabed. Some punch straight down, others fanning out at an angle for up to several kilometers. The same platform may be extracting both oil and natural gas at the same time. Out here, you're surrounded by the sea with nowhere to go. The weather is often horrible, and the work on a rig can be rough, dirty, and dangerous. It's difficult to find and retain the skilled workers needed to pull the oil from the sea, so the platforms are built to keep the workers happy. Movies, internet cafes, gym equipment, 
even great food, are all provided by management to ensure the men are entertained. During 12-hour shifts, workers handle heavy equipment and deal with great heights or great depths. But there are strict rules too. To protect the safety of everyone on board, there's no drinking and smoking is severely restricted. One of Britain's worst disasters happened in the North Sea oil fields. In 1988, on Occidental Petroleum's Piper Alpha platform, the gas exploded and set fire to oil. A hundred and sixty-seven men died. The potential for disaster is never far away. But on this January day, the marathon oil workers prepare as they always do. All 16 are scheduled to spend two weeks on Marathon's Alpha platform, followed by two weeks off. To these men, getting to work has become routine. But getting a ticket on this flight calls for something a little out of the ordinary. None of them is permitted to board a helicopter without first going through this, helicopter underwater escape training. Their lives may depend on knowing how to get out of a submerged helicopter or oil rig and knowing what to do once they find themselves in the chilly North Sea. Several accidents over more than 20 years have driven home the point. Training may help a worker survive. Before they set off on every flight, they must watch the video, how to behave if there's an emergency on your flight. They've seen it all a thousand times. In an emergency, if time does not permit, just tighten your lap strap and brace for impact. To exit through the windows, pull the red tab to completely remove the rubber seal. The passengers fasten their survival the suits. Out. Made of Gore-Tex, these dry suits won't keep them afloat but are supposed to keep the water out if the workers are thrown into the sea. Their bright colors are also designed to make rescue easier. The trip to the Bray Alpha oil platform is 230 kilometers. If all goes well, it will take little more than an hour. Then, 120 miles out, they'll reach an area called the gate. That's where all the helicopters split up and go their separate ways to the individual oil platforms. Bray Alpha is about 40 kilometers from the gate. For part of the journey, the radar operators at air traffic control in Aberdeen won't be able to see them. The reason why we lose low level radar coverage out over the North Sea is in essence because the earth is round. As a helicopter's flying outbound to an oil rig, it's actually following the curvature of the earth. But radar pulses travel in straight lines, which means that as they travel further and further away, a gap opens up between the surface of the earth and the radar waves. If an aircraft flies into that gap, then it'll disappear from radar. In the case of Aberdeen, and a helicopter operating about 2,000 feet will disappear into that gap at about 80 miles. It's a black hole which Super Puma 56 Charlie is now entering. The helicopter and the 18 men on board are over halfway to the rigs, and from this moment on, no one knows exactly where they are. 56 Charlie is a Super Puma helicopter serving the North Sea oil platforms off the coast of Britain. It's halfway through a long flight carrying 16 passengers to the Bray Alpha oil rig. The crew is getting concerned about what they see on their weather radar. The forecast called for scattered clouds, but the weather is changing fast. What do you think about this cloud? 
It's quite thin. Yeah, but look, we're getting some cumulus too. Mm. It's quite small, about 100 yards across. Yeah, but it's developing a bit. Mm. Cumulus are puffy white clouds like balls of cotton wool. They're beautiful to look at and usually harmless. They only last between 5 and 40 minutes. But helicopter pilots prefer to go above them if possible, because the air inside and below gets very bumpy. Let's try to climb above it. Go to 5,000 feet. Right. Well, look, there's a line of them. All along the route, exactly where we're going. Mm. Yeah, we're not gaining anything by this. No. Let's drop back down to 3,000 feet. Right. So far, the weather is nothing to worry about. But over the North Sea, it can change suddenly. This corner of Europe is where the warm winds from the Atlantic meet the icy blasts from the Arctic and Siberia. The warm water vapor condenses into clouds, cools, then sinks. It creates strong winds, pushing the huge masses around. The friction caused by this motion can make the clouds electrically charged, and that electricity can be released as lightning. What starts out as a placid day can end up in a violent storm. It's now one hour after takeoff, and 5-6 Charlie is approaching the gate, the point where helicopters begin their descent to the individual oil platforms. They're 25 miles from their destination, and the weather is starting to get worse. Bray traffic, 5-6 Charlie, 120 miles on the 056 HMR. They make contact with Bray Traffic Watch, located on one of the oil platforms. It handles all the comings and goings of helicopters. But Bray Traffic doesn't have radar. It has to rely on the pilots to tell them where they are. Leaving 3,000 feet, would you take the flight watch? Roger, 5-6 Charlie, I have your flight watch. Aberdeen information, Bristow's 5-6 Charlie at 120 miles. Leaving 3,000 feet, Bray has the flight watch. Roger, 5-6 Charlie, continue with Bray Traffic. Quite suddenly, the weather has changed. Instead of the harmless fluffy balls of cotton wool, a line of dangerous cumulonimbus clouds is now blocking their path. They rise up like huge white mountains, more than 10,000 meters, far higher than the chopper can fly. Underneath, they're dark and menacing. Pilots try to avoid them at all costs. Inside, gusts of wind can reach up to 100 kilometers an hour. The turbulence can make the flight unpleasant, but that's only part of the danger. The cumulonimbus, that's the granddaddy of all clouds. It stretches from around about 1,000 feet at its base all the way up to 28, 30,000 feet. They are the most dangerous clouds that aircraft can come across, particularly small aircraft like helicopters. Within a cumulonimbus, you're going to find severe turbulence. You're going to find icing, you're going to find heavy rain, and of course you're going to find lightning. If you're flying a helicopter, that's not where you want to be. Lightning is one of the most powerful forces of nature. Around the Earth, it strikes an average of 100 times per second, each strike with a power of up to a billion volts. Aircraft can't completely avoid it. On average, every passenger jet will be hit once a year by lightning but the design of the planes helps prevent them being badly damaged. Their bodies are traditionally made of aluminium, which is a good conductor of electricity. The lightning passes harmlessly along the fuselage and exits from the tail. Helicopters use the same type of design to keep safe, and helicopters need it in the North Sea. With such stormy weather and so many helicopters, lightning strikes are inevitable. As they begin their descent, the Super Puma enters the line of clouds that stands in their path. Bits of cloud coming up here. That's OK, it's so green. Let's carry on through that. Green on the weather radar means there's rain, but it's not heavy enough to worry about. What the pilot sees in that is that it's simply like a television screen. On that television screen, he has a map, and overlaid on top of that map is a series of banded colors. If there's no rain, he has a blank map. If there's lots of rain and it's heavy, he has lots of red squares on that, and that gives you the idea of the intensity and the location of the rainfall. On board 5-6 Charlie, the weather gets more intense. They begin to get pelted by hail. Hey, where'd this come from? It's coming in through the vent. 
Looks like big inside a bean bag swamped by polystyrene balls. It's so thick. How come the engines are still running? There can't be any air left out there. No. <laughs> now another problem. We've got a hard over on the ice detector. It's probably just an ice pellet stuck in the probe. Right. The helicopter has an ice detector, a probe outside the craft, which is supposed to tell the pilots whether there's ice on the blades. But they think it's become jammed with ice and is giving a false reading. And then... Disaster. Bloody hell. What was that? Lightning, I saw it. Well, this is bad. There's something very, very wrong with this. We'll have to go down, I'm afraid. The helicopter has been damaged, but they don't know how badly. The entire body is shaking and vibrating. The crew's first instinct is to get down to a lower altitude in case the worst happens and they fall out of the sky. Mayday, mayday, five, six, Charlie, lightning strikes, severe vibration. Mayday, mayday. 40 kilometers away, another helicopter is about to leave an oil platform. Commander Brian Backhouse is loading passengers onto 56 Bravo and preparing to fly back to Aberdeen. That's everyone. All set. Suddenly, the loading officer hears Lionel Soul's Mayday call on his radio. Mayday, Mayday, 56 Charlie, lightning strike. Hear that Mayday, 56 Charlie? Gentlemen, my apologies, but we have to disembark you. We have an airborne emergency on a sister aircraft. Backhouse hurriedly unloads his passengers. He intends to help if he can. Meanwhile, a gale is steadily building up, with winds in excess of 70 kilometers an hour. The seas are mounting. The crew of 56 Charlie are struggling to keep control of their crippled helicopter. After the initial flash, though, the situation hasn't got worse. The Grampian Freedom is a standby ship positioned near the oil rigs to give oil workers a way to escape if anything goes wrong. Her skipper, John McInnes, hears the helicopter's distress call. We increased uh, the speed, the full speed ahead. Uh, everybody was informed about the vessel uh, and told to get ready uh, for survivors to be taken aboard. Back on the Bravo platform, what was a routine flight for Brian Backhouse is about to become a rescue mission. He intends to find the stricken helicopter and nurse it to safety. If it crashes into the sea, he'll direct rescue ships to the spot. But they're not sure where to go. Let's go to the gate and proceed from there. At least they have a starting point. The Grampian Freedom doesn't know where to go either. They're getting conflicting messages about where 56 Charlie is. The helicopter's tiny size and the rough seas make it hard to find. On the damaged helicopter, Commander Roberts briefs the passengers. Gentlemen, you are obviously aware of the severe vibration. We've had a lightning strike, so please pull up your hoods, zip up your suits and prepare for a possible ditching. Countless hours of training is supposed to have prepared all on board for a moment like this. In a real emergency, how many will remember it? 1,200 feet, we're still flying. Let's try to make it a Bray Alpha and land there. Their destination, the Bray Alpha platform, is now only 11 kilometers away. Three minutes have passed since the explosion, and things don't seem to be getting any worse. I'll just try a few small inputs, make sure everything's working. Yes, we've got control in pitch, we've got control in roll, and we've got control in yaw. Tail rotor! The helicopter is beginning to spin round, a sure sign that something's happened to the tail rotor. The only thing the pilots can do to stop the spinning is to switch off the main rotor blade. Power off! Engines off! Ditching has become inevitable. Five six Charlie is falling fast, more than 600 meters a minute. With the main rotor acting like a kind of parachute, the blades being turned only by the air that rushes through them. Mayday, 
Mayday. Tail rotor failure. Ditching. Brace for emergency landing. At this speed, they're about 40 seconds from hitting the North Sea. The other pilots in 5-6 Bravo are searching in vain. There's no sign of 5-6 Charlie in the sky or in the water. Then they hear another distress call. Mayday! Mayday! Tail rotor failure! Ditching! Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Relaying for 5-6 Charlie. We have a suspected tail rotor failure. He is ditching. Commander Backhouse in 5-6 Bravo knows that he is closest to the stricken helicopter. Everything depends on him. But he's not equipped to locate the distress beacon 5-6 Charlie will use when it ditches. All he can do is search mile after mile of grey sea. Back on the Grampian Freedom, the crew begins searching the sea as well as the sky. But they know 5-6 Bravo can cover ground more quickly than the enormous, slow-moving ship. They do what they can and wait for better directions. Floats, floats, I can't find the floats! I got it, I got it! Just keep it at trim angle. Right. The pilots of 5-6 Charlie are about to attempt one of the most difficult maneuvers, ditching or landing in the middle of the heaving sea. Floats under the helicopter are meant to keep it from sinking. If they're deployed too soon before touchdown, the chopper may lose what little stability it has and topple over. Too late, and they won't inflate completely. Instead of riding the waves, the helicopter will sink below them. There's no second chance. They time it perfectly. We're down. Seems quite stable. They've landed safely, but no one knows if they will stay afloat. Helicopters are top heavy, and they fear it could keel over and sink at any moment. Let's get out of here! Do the door! They need to get the life rafts out, inflate them, and board them quickly. They fear that if the helicopter rolls over, it will trap them all inside. Lift that end! On the rope! You go back and help with the evacuation. I'm going to shut things down here. Right. I'm going to try one last mayday call. But the evacuation doesn't go smoothly. When they throw out one of the life rafts, the strong wind blows it back against the helicopter. They can't get into it. Can't get this one down. Can we go up the other side? How do we all stay together anyway? Off you go. Go on. Go on. Go. Go. Mayday, mayday. Five, six, Charlie. We are on the water, floating, manning the dinghy. He doesn't mention their position. Make room. Make room. Make room. The raft is dangerously overloaded. There are 18 on board, and it's only meant for 14. Water is already up to their ankles and rising. Once in the raft, they have no way of communicating where they are. For the first time, the pilots are able to see what caused the disaster. The rear rotor blade assembly and gearbox have broken off and are hanging down the side of the helicopter, held on by just a couple of pipes. No one realizes it yet, but in the rush, they've forgotten to bring the distress beacon with them from the helicopter. It sends out a signal that can be picked up by rescuers. Forgetting it could mean the difference between life and death. Two ropes attach the life raft to the helicopter. They're meant to stop the raft from drifting away, but they'll also drag them down if the helicopter sinks. One of the passengers has a knife. Shall I cut the line? No, not yet. We have a better chance of being spotted if we're close to the helicopter. Problems mount. The passengers are trying to raise the canopy to protect them, but it gets stuck. Without the canopy, they're at the mercy of the waves. And then, the helicopter itself becomes a danger. When the doors were jettisoned, they were supposed to be designed to slip down into the water and sink. Instead, one of them, which has a jagged edge, is floating on the surface and is heading straight for the raft. The life raft has been punctured by the floating door. Everything you got, we're gonna sink. Now don't worry about it, we're not gonna sink. We've got double layer rubber tubes here filled with air. It cannot 
cannot sink. One way, but we're under. Not the pilots sink, do their best to put show. on a brave face. There are other helicopters and ships out there. They know we're down. They heard our mayday. The overloaded life raft is getting lower and lower in the water. Inside, it's already waist deep. Now the pounding waves are pushing them beneath the sharp edges of the drooping helicopter blades. We need to get some distance. We'll have to cut the line. There are supposed to be two safety lines connecting the raft to the helicopter, one short, one long. But the long line is broken. The long line's been cut. It's been shredded. You'll have to cut the short one. The short line is the only thing attaching them to the helicopter. If they cut that, they'll quickly drift away, a tiny raft full of men at the mercy of the sea. But if they don't cut it, the jagged edges of the helicopter could tear their life raft to shreds and sink them all. Eighteen people have scrambled aboard a life raft after their helicopter crashed into the North Sea. The raft is overloaded. It's been punctured by the jagged metal edges of the helicopter door and is getting lower and lower in the water. They have to get away from the helicopter. Flight officer Lionel Soule takes the fateful decision and cuts the rope. They begin to drift away into the storm. The conditions are deadly. Most of their survival suits are leaking freezing water. For a person in the water, Hypothermia can begin when the temperatures of air and water added together is below 50 degrees centigrade. In the North Sea in winter, the temperature is far below that. Normal muscle and brain functions are quickly affected. The core body temperature will sink, followed by unconsciousness and death. Their chances of rescue are slim. No one knows where they are, just a tiny dot on a vast, turbulent sea. The men are desperate. This could be their last chance. Quickly, pass me those flares! The flares! In the pocket behind you! Come on, spot a flare, you blind bastard! But it's all in vain. The helicopter passes by. The men can't believe it. Their only hope is gone. On 5-6 Bravo, Brian Backhouse can see only grey seas. But suddenly, his co-pilot spots something. Contact, right, two o'clock. OK, Roger, let's investigate. Target confirmed. 56 Charlie, stand by for position report. Like a guardian angel, 56 Bravo hovers directly above the survivors for over an hour, directing rescue boats and aircraft towards this tiny speck in the ocean. He came in and hovered fairly close because he wanted to count the number of people on board the life raft. So for a while, he was right over the top of us and blowing us around a bit. But as soon as he had gotten the information he wanted, he backed off and he was just marking the position for the rescue car to find us. First to arrive is the Grampian Freedom. We had lookouts posted all around the vessel, some on top of the bridge, on each wing of the bridge. A helicopter came and he started discussing your bow, which is now our procedure in that kind of situation. Almost a mile away from the raft, the Grampian Freedom launches its fast rescue boat. The boat sets off at full speed to the rescue. The rain and waves make finding the raft difficult. Hey, 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 there's the boat! It's coming fast! No, 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 don't sink us! Relax, boys, they know what they're doing. Let's go, quickly, go! 
The rescue boat throws a lifeline to the stranded men, and they begin pulling themselves to safety. But there's another challenge ahead their training hasn't prepared them for. You reach the, uh, the standby boat, and you're looking at the hull, a huge steel hull. You said, I'm never going to get up there. But uh, the crews are well trained. They wait for the, uh, the swell to go up and down in the right motions. And they have a large net hanging down the side of the, of the boat. And they said, we're going to come alongside. We'll be on the top of the wave. And when we shout jump, you jump and grab the net. Don't look back, because we'll be gone. We came alongside, high up on the wave, grabbed the net. The wave went back down, they were away and they pulled off and we just climbed the last few feet over the side onto the, onto the Grand Vin Freedom. Later that day, a rescue helicopter winches up 14 of the survivors and flies them back to Aberdeen. Four of the men, however, never want to travel in a helicopter again, so they refuse to leave the Grampian Freedom. They're in for ever more misery. They're buffeted by a Force 10 gale the whole of their long journey back to Aberdeen. Through their skill and against all the odds, Cedric Roberts and Lionel Soul have saved the lives of all on board. I must admit at the time I did think that was it, we were going to die. The whole world had changed from being really good to being what I thought was a complete disaster at that time. It was the worst situation I'd ever been in in the air, and I was very worried that that was going to be it. But the day after the accident, they came under suspicion. Their report on what happened starts being questioned. Lightning, notionally, I should, at least, should not affect a very powerful North Sea helicopter. This is the first time I can recall a lightning strike having ended up with this kind of conclusion. The experts are skeptical of the pilot's story. No other helicopter is known to have crashed into the North Sea because of lightning. Perhaps there had been some mechanical failure. There were even whispers of pilot error, of recklessly flying into storm clouds. The evidence to support their story was now beneath the waves with 5-6 Charlie. The Air Accident Investigation Branch, Britain's air crash detectives, begins searching for the truth. It may look like a rig, but the Stay Dive is actually a ship, mostly used for servicing oil platforms. It has nine powerful engines which keep it stable in almost any weather. And it carries miniature submarines for underwater exploration. A day after the accident, it's brought in to find and raise the missing helicopter from the bottom of the North Sea. The investigation gets off to a good start. Within a day, the television cameras on board the Stay Dive's two submersibles locate what's left of 5-6 Charlie on the seabed but raising it is a different matter. They carry on working into the night. Soon, several pieces of 5-6 Charlie have been recovered, but still not the vital clue, the missing tail rotor. Ed Trimble was the AAIB's lead investigator. But the big problem was to recover the tail rotor assembly. Without that, the investigation was literally going nowhere. We knew that the tail rotor assembly uh, had been dangling over the side of the pylon as the helicopter had ditched, and it had therefore detached at some point between the ditching and where we had caught up with the main wreckage. Keeping the stay dive going would cost another 20,000 pounds a day. Ed Trimble rang his boss. He was fairly skeptical of our chances. Uh, he asked what I thought our chances were of finding the uh, tail rotor. And I, being an eternal optimist, I said 80%. To which he replied, I think you'd be very lucky if you've got a 10% chance of recovering uh, the tail rotor assembly in the North Sea. 
Ed Trimble stays up all night, relentlessly monitoring the underwater cameras. I didn't want to be in a situation where uh, we would have missed any evidence of further wreckage, and in particular, uh, any um, parts of the tail of our assembly. Go get yourself a coffee, Eddie. By the time uh, 8 o'clock was looming, I decided to go down to the galley to uh, get a coffee. And I couldn't have been away any more than maximum 7 to 10 minutes when I suddenly heard these tremendously excited shouts from uh, our team. As I walked in, I ran in, there, smack in the middle of the screen, was the whole of the tail rotor assembly. And even at the first glance, I could see that one of the tail rotor blades showed clear evidence of a lightning strike. The crew was right. The submarine's cameras reveal telltale burn marks on the tail rotor blade. A close look at the wreckage on the deck reveals that two of the main rotor blades were also struck by lightning. But it's this tail rotor that suffered the most damage. Since lightning is not known to have forced a helicopter to crash into the North Sea before, the question is, why now? Ed Trimble called in lightning expert John Hardwick to discover just what had hit 5-6 Charlie. What we wanted to do with this set of tests was to take a set of tail rotor blades from the Super Puma helicopter and subject them to varying energy levels of simulated lightning strikes. The lightning uh, objectives at Cullum basically were to try and reproduce the degree of lightning damage in order to identify what kind of level of energy was associated with this particular strike. This home video of the tests was taken by Ed Trimble. Representatives of the company that makes the Super Puma were there too. Hardwick ran the blade through several lightning strikes until he was able to reproduce the damage found on the rotor blade. To do it, he had to generate a simulated strike of enormous power. Something far more dangerous than anyone thought the helicopter would be exposed to. Something that wasn't supposed to happen over the North Sea. There have been a few incidents over the years, minor strikes, a little bit of damage of a helicopter, but we never expected anything as severe as happened on that day. For one brief instant, it was more than all the electrical power being consumed in the entire United States. Some 30 billion watts. And this enormous flash of lightning had happened over the North Sea where each year almost three million passengers fly unsuspecting to the oil platforms. The helicopters we fly are certified to the higher standards. It's the same as you get on a major airliner flying transatlantic. So we had no reason to believe that any lightning we had encountered would do any severe damage to the helicopter. Ordinary lightning wouldn't. But this wasn't ordinary. A lightning strike generates a huge pulse of energy. We can detect these pulses of energy via multiple transmitters and receivers that are situated throughout Europe. The information is calibrated locally, and once the position has been triangulated, that's passed to the Met Office in London. When the records were examined, they showed something very peculiar. This is what they think happened. Inside cumulonimbus clouds, tiny ice crystals are swept upwards by the wind currents. At the top of the cloud, where it's much colder, they combine with other crystals to form hail. The hail, being heavy, plummets back to Earth. On the way down, it hits the rising water crystals, causing friction. The crystals become electrically charged. On that particular day, there was very little in the way of indication that there was any significance in these clouds. We're flying along, everything just seemed very normal. We went through what seemed to us, by comparison to what was around that day, a fairly small cloud. But there was suddenly a lot of snow and ice pellets in the air. I've never seen as much in the way of soft hail pellets in my whole flying career. Uh, and the worrying thing was that immediately we knew that Obviously, there was a lot, a high level of, of energy in that cloud to produce that amount of soft hail. 
which also meant there was a high chance of there being lightning there, but by that time it was too late. When a helicopter enters the cloud, the sharp tips of its whirling rotor blades cut through these crystals, causing more friction, more electricity, until it's all released in a blinding flash. The records show that the flash which hit 5-6 Charlie had been the only one recorded over the North Sea that day, caused almost certainly by the helicopter itself. However, for some reason, nearly all the damage had been confined to the tail rotor. What was it about the tail rotor that had made it especially vulnerable? Then Ed Trimble made a remarkable discovery. When the Civil Aviation Authority certified the Super Puma as safe, they had missed something important, something which may have caused 5-6 Charlie to fall from the sky. Safety investigators examined the wreckage of a helicopter, which crash-landed in the North Sea. As they study the ruined aircraft more closely, they uncover the cause of the accident. When the British Civil Aviation Authority laid down the lightning safety standards, they were looking at fiberglass blades, then the normal material for helicopter rotors. But in the 1980s, plane makers began using the new composite materials, like carbon fiber, which were lighter and stronger. In particular, they began making the rotor blades out of carbon fiber instead of fiberglass. It was assumed that the same standards would apply equally to the new blades. In the industry, that's known as read across, and it's very dangerous. In fact, it was the very design of these composite blades which brought down 5-6 Charlie. Although made of carbon fiber, composite blades have a metal anti-erosion strip glued on to protect the edge. That's where the trouble starts. Carbon is a conductor of electricity, but it's a thousand times worse than aluminum. So you get a thousand times as much heat produced. The carbon blade gets very, very hot. And when the current meets the metal strip running along the edge, there is furious arcing and sparking until finally part of the erosion strip explodes. As little as 100 grams of the erosion strip flew off, but it was enough. Without its weight, the rear rotor was unbalanced. That's what caused the vibration felt on board 5-6 Charlie immediately after the lightning strike. Three minutes later, when Lionel Soul tested out the controls, the unbalanced blades put the tail rotor under enormous stress. The bolts holding it on snapped. We've lost the tail rotor! The tail rotor's gone! It was like a blowout in a car, only much, much worse. Things at that point were really very, very worrying. Uh, we both knew what had happened. We'd lost the tail rotor. And if you don't do exactly the right thing at that point, your life expectancy is very short. It's, it's seconds. We had to do the right thing. We managed to point it into wind, and there was quite a big sea building up. And at 100 feet, I pulled back on the stick to flare the helicopter, slow down its rate of descent, and we were very fortunate at that point, a nice friendly wave came along, and as I leveled the helicopter, a wave came up and sat on the top of it, and we went down, and it was one of the best landings I've ever done, but that was luck more than judgment. As bad as it was, it could have been worse. The two hydraulic pipes connecting the assembly to the helicopter did not break. These two small diameter pipes had held the mass of the gearbox and tail rotor assembly dangling over the right side of the pylon. Without the weight of the rotor assembly, the helicopter would have tipped forward. Had that tail rotor gearbox and tail rotor assembly completely separated from the helicopter, then all 18 lives would have been lost because the helicopter would have pitched down irrecoverably and um, gone into the North Sea. The investigators found the answer to the mystery of a helicopter crash, but they stumbled across a bigger problem, one that affects every air traveler. Investigators believe that 5-6 Charlie's violent end was caused by a savage lightning strike greater than anything it was built to withstand. 
And when the lightning hit, it exposed a problem in the carbon fiber blades that made them vulnerable. The tremendous heat created where the carbon fiber met the metal erosion strip could occur again. And the same type of violent reaction could hypothetically take place in any aircraft that has carbon fiber mixed with other materials. Increasingly, aluminium is being replaced with carbon fiber. The world's largest plane, the A380 Airbus, for instance, has over 20%. What will happen if these planes encounter a monster lightning strike? This was the investigator's biggest concern arising out of this super puma accident. The findings were unexpected and treated with some skepticism. Though the tests indicated that an unexpectedly large lightning strike hit 5-6 Charlie, Britain's Civil Aviation Authority refused to accept it. No action was taken to increase the safety standards that these helicopters must meet. I thought that the reaction was poor. There seemed to be uh, a real reluctance on their behalf to accept the evidence. If Britain's air crash detectives are right, there is a real concern facing air travelers. Flashes of lightning far greater than aircraft are supposed to encounter are possible. And aircraft made of newer composite materials are at increased risk. For the Super Puma, though, the lessons have been learned. The design of the rotor blades has been vastly strengthened. The erosion strips are now secured with heavy bolts. And pilots have been instructed to give storm clouds a wider berth. The men who must fly these machines to work are prepared to accept the risks. Well, I think the morning there we ditched. We were very, very fortunate because the, the outcome could have gone horribly wrong. But we survived. We got home. Uh, my feelings of that morning was this could never happen to me. Now, when I fly in a chopper, especially in the winter time, if it's going to be buffed about with wind, I sometimes get the, uh, in the back of your mind, this can't happen to me again. But we've all a choice. We've all a choice either to stop or we carry on. And I'm still there 25 years later, still learning a living. The crash of 5-6 Charlie was a hair-raising incident that could so easily have ended in tragedy. In the winter of 1995, the skill of Commander Sed Roberts and Flight Officer Lionel Souls saved the lives of their 16 passengers. Roberts and Soul receive an award for their work. The Guild of Air Pilots and Air Navigators recognized their skill and bravery in the emergency landing. Freight train is out of control. Get off boat. Tell them we got a runaway train. 7551 to West Colton. Its brakes can't hold it as it rockets down a mountain. Mayday, mayday. We're doing 90 miles an hour. 9-0. Now thousands of tons of steel and freight are heading straight for a small town. We're going to die on that curve. An innocent mistake risks the lives of everyone on board and many more in the town below. San Bernardino, California, a quiet suburban town at the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains. It's a great place to raise a family, in between the emptiness of the Mojave Desert and the bustle of Los Angeles. When we had problems in the neighborhood, we could go to one another, and it was a very nice neighborhood. But in 1989, San Bernardino is rocked by two disasters. Six people are killed, 18 houses are completely destroyed. It begins with an out of control train. 60, 70, 80! 
and ends with a raging fire. You could see a huge cloud of black smoke in the air. The scene looked like Dante's Inferno. The disasters appear linked, but they happen more than a week apart. Investigators comb through the wreckage to find the hidden connection. They uncover a series of shocking decisions which have deadly consequences for some and scar a town forever. Early morning, May the 12th, 1989. On a railroad siding in the desert, a freight train waits to head up over California's San Gabriel Mountains. Frank Holland is the chief engineer for Southern Pacific Freight Train number 7551 East. Well, my job as an engineer is to get on the train, operate the locomotives, um, obey the rules, speeds, slow down at restrictions, and get the train from point A to point B. His work on this trip actually began the night before at the Mojave Rail Yard. Some of Southern Pacific's freight trains are put together here, picking up crews and engines to take them across the country. Holland is here to collect the paperwork he'll need for the journey. Hey, Frank. Hey. Holland was promoted to chief engineer three years before. OK, clearance form, train orders, train list, and tonnage profile. His paperwork tells him he's hauling 69 freight cars, each one weighing 54,431 kilos. Holland also learns that the cars are all filled with the same thing, Trona. It's a non-toxic chemical used in fertilizer. So you, you start making your calculations on what kind of horsepower you're going to have to have to take that train down that hill. And that will tell you at what speed you can go. Thanks. Have a good one. Altogether, Holland's paperwork tells him he's hauling more than three and a half million kilos of cargo, more than 10 jumbo jets. The cargo's final destination is South America. Today, Holland's only taking it as far as the West Colton Terminal near Los Angeles. To do that, he'll have to haul the cargo up the San Gabriel Mountains and through the Cajon Pass. Then he'll carefully slow his huge train as it winds down the mountain. OK, hey guys, we're going down to West Colton. We've got 69 cars filled with Trona. Everett Crown is the conductor of 7551. He'll sit up in the front engine to assist Holland. Alan Reese is the brake man this morning. He'll ride two engines back. Between them, the three men have almost 50 years of experience working the trains with Southern Pacific. To make sure he has enough power to move his train up and down the mountain, Holland has asked for a little assistance. Southern Pacific dispatchers sent him two helper engines. Lawrence Hill is the engineer at the back. Robert Waterbury is his brake man. While they've run this route before, it's not where they normally work. They don't know the weight of the cargo they're helping to haul, and they don't ask. 7551 East now has four engines up front and two behind. With the last two in place, the train is all set to go. Helper calling head end. Head end. Coupled and ready to go. Roger that. Seven five five one East slowly gathers steam. In just an hour and a half, it'll reach the top of the mountains, the thirteen hundred meter high Cajon Pass. Helper to head end. Head end. 
We've cleared the siding. Thank you. On the other side of the mountains, the town of San Bernardino is slowly coming to life. The Muskoy section is a fairly new development on the northwestern edge of the town. It's filled with single-storey homes and growing families. Christopher Shaw is waking up at 2326 Duffy Street. It's his mother's house, but after a fight with his girlfriend, he'd spent the night. Across the street, Ruth Green has succeeded in getting three children out of bed and off to school. Her only daughter, Lavon, is staying home. It's just my daughter and I, and we're just making ready for what we considered a normal morning. We had had our breakfast and was straightening up in the kitchen. One of the only things people don't like about this part of San Bernardino is the train tracks. Trains race by on top of a six meter high levee. Some of the houses on Duffy Street back right up to the tracks. When the homes went up for sale, the realtor was showing my husband a home that was on the same side of the street as the tracks. The tracks would have been behind our home. And he said, no, he didn't want that. Just after 7 AM, 7551 East reaches the highest point of its trip, the Cajon Pass. It's all downhill from here. The pass is a vital rail link between Los Angeles and the rest of the world. It's one of only three ways to get through the mountains. Dozens of trains rumble through here every day. Traditionally, in railroading, mountain railroaders are respected as the big guys, the tough guys, because they have the most demanding job. Cajon Pass is one of the toughest mountain passes for railroaders to deal with in the entire United States. So many trains go over it, and it, it is extremely demanding that everyone has to be on their toes 100% all the time. No chance. No? No. Engineer Frank Holland and conductor Everett Crown have the train right on time. There hasn't been any communication between the men at the front and the two men at the back of the train since the trip began. There's been no need. Everything's running smoothly. Now comes the most critical part of the journey, slowing the massive train as it starts down the mountain. What we do when we run a train from the Mojave area to Colton is basically we drive it off a cliff. At that point, the track tips over and goes downhill at a very steep grade, 2.2%. And for trains, 2.2 feet down in a, every 100 feet is like falling off a cliff. As 7551 East begins heading downhill, the crews still believe it's a normal run. What they don't know is that their train is already out of control and they have no way to slow it down. May the 12th, 1989. Just after seven in the morning, Southern Pacific freight train 7551 East begins the long, slow descent from the top of the San Gabriel Mountains. The massive train is hauling 69 cars full of freight. At the bottom of the hill, the sleepy town of San Bernardino, California. As the tracks start dipping downhill, engineer Frank Holland first applies his dynamic brakes. They slow each of the six engines, reducing the speed of the entire train. He's only allowed to go 48 kilometers an hour through the pass. He checks in with Lawrence Hill, the engineer and the helper engine at the back of the train, to make sure he can maintain his speed. Call in the helper. This is the helper. You got all your dynamics? Yeah, I'm in full. Roger that.
The first part of the downhill run twists back and forth 56 times. The friction from the turns helps slow the mammoth train. Even with the turns, Holland starts applying his air brakes. They put pressure on the wheels of each freight car. The train is now traveling at 40 kilometers an hour. That's exactly where Holland wants it to stay. Once through the curves, though, Holland's brakeman, Everett Crown, notices that the train is picking up speed. Frank, we're at 30. Should be at 25. The, the train actually was maintaining its speed. It might have been picking up just a little bit, but we still had a long way to go. It's creeping. Confused, Holland continues to increase the pressure on the air brakes. But the train just keeps going faster. By the time it reached 40 miles an hour, I was very concerned. The, the train was uh, speeding. As the train approaches 72 kilometers an hour, Holland turns his air brakes on full. But it doesn't help. At the bottom of the hill, the track bends around the town of San Bernardino. Frank Holland knows he's not supposed to go more than 64 kilometers an hour around the corner. Partway down the hill, He's already going much faster than that. Ruth Green's husband has left for work. Her three youngest children are off to school. Across the street, Chris Shaw is just about to take a shower. Engineer Frank Holland knows there are several houses that are right in the way if his train comes off the track. I've been over that territory many times, and yeah, I knew that there was a curb coming down there that we weren't going to make. At the back of the train, engineer Lawrence Hill also knows they're in trouble. The air brakes are turned on full, but the train isn't slowing down at all. Something must be wrong up there. Without talking to the front of the train, Hill slams on the train's emergency brakes. It's their last chance. The train at that point tried to slow down a little bit. A couple seconds later, it was off to the races. It just took off like a rocket. The speed was going up so fast, I, uh, I couldn't even believe it. The emergency brakes haven't worked. Smoke begins pouring out from underneath the train, and it just keeps going faster. 60, 70, 80. It stopped at 90 because that's as far as the speedometer would go. But Holland knows 7551 East is still picking up speed. I'm thinking, my God, I'm fired. <laughs> Actually, that's what I thought. I'm just looking at everything that I've done. I'm trying to go back and see where I had made a mistake, what had happened. 7551 to West Colton. 7551 to West Colton. We're trying to get a hold of the uh, train dispatcher, and he won't answer. The train is out of control, and they can't tell anyone about it. At that point, we're just kind of out there by ourselves. Try that phone again. 7551 to West Colton. West Colton, go ahead. We have a slight problem. At the back of the train, engineer Lawrence Hill listens to the radio call. I don't know if we can get this train stopped. He breaks in, desperate to tell the dispatcher how dangerous the situation is. Mayday, mayday, we're doing 90 miles an hour, 9-0, out of control. Won't be able to stop till we hit Colton. 
But there's nothing the dispatcher can do. The train is traveling at more than 160 kilometers an hour. The houses of San Bernardino are just seconds away. Down in the town, a strange rumbling breaks the morning calm. My house began to vibrate. The house was rattling so hard, I would have thought that the windows would have broke. It just got worse and worse. By then, I realized it was the train. As we were coming up to that curve, I looked over at Everett and I said, We're going to die on that curve. He um, wild-eyed like he was just couldn't believe and just scared to death. And I'm sure I looked the same way. All I knew is that I just put my feet up there and I said, oh, hang on, here we go. I never expected to survive. helper engine at the back of the train, engineer Lawrence Hill desperately calls the Southern Pacific dispatcher. Being at the end of the train has saved him from injury, but he's not sure everyone else has been so lucky. SP7551, anybody please come in. It takes more than a minute for Hill to get a response to his frantic call. Saugus Dispatcher, 7551 East, over. Saugus Dispatcher, we are all over the ground here. I haven't heard anything from the head end. They may need some assistance. We went on the ground. Incredibly, engineer Frank Holland survives the wreck. The man in charge of the train crawls away from his ruined engine, the first of the cars to derail. Everett, where's Everett? We gotta get him, he's still inside. Let's get you down first. He's helped out of the train by eyewitnesses to the disaster. When they pulled me off of the locomotive and set me down, it was just, I, I just couldn't believe it. The cars were just mangled, the locomotives were destroyed. It was just, you know, unbelievable devastation. I looked back at that and I went, oh my God. What did I do? Frank Holland has broken several ribs. One of his lungs is punctured. The man who was riding with him, Everett Crown, is soon found dead. As is Alan Reese, the brakeman who was riding in the third engine. Footage taken shortly after the crash shows the scale of the disaster. Seven houses have been destroyed. The train itself is a write-off. As the dust cleared, then you could see some of the cars had, you know, toppled over. You could see that it looked like, you know, some houses were gone. You could see just a twisted, jumbled mass of a metal. These cars are turned over. You're really trying to grapple with, what is this? What's happened? Alan Simpson is a battalion chief with the San Bernardino Fire Department. The house that we focused on with the information that uh, the mother gave us about one individual was totally obliterated. You wouldn't have recognized it as a house. It looked like a jumble of somebody gone through it with a bulldozer. They were hollering that there's somebody still in there. We later learned that that was 
where Chris Shaw lived. And when you looked at that house, it was like you would say there was no way anybody could still be alive under all of that rubble and wreckage. The wreckage is also hiding an explosive problem no one in the neighborhood knew about. Running alongside the railway, about two meters below the ground, is a pipeline carrying fuel back up the mountain. If it's been damaged in the derailment, a single spark could cause a major explosion. Prior to this incident, we were not aware that this pipeline existed and ran directly behind our homes. The thought's always in the back of your mind if you have something like that. This is major, 14-inch pipe full of pressurized fuel. We know what that's going to do if it ruptures. The pipeline is operated by the Calnev Pipeline Company. It pulls hundreds of barrels of fuel from the pipe, trying to reduce the size of any potential explosion. But much more fuel remains behind. Automatic safety valves in the pipeline that are supposed to shut off individual sections aren't working. The company can't completely drain the area under the derailment. Almost three hours after the crash, rescue workers find the body of a small child. He's the second young boy killed in the disaster. Well, after we recovered the two children from the one house, uh, there wasn't a lot of hope for finding anybody else at that point. But you never give up hope. You, you always keep trying. But there's pressure to wind the search down. Every moment spent looking for Chris Shaw further delays the cleanup. And Kalnev can't check the pipeline properly until the rail cars are gone. An entire neighborhood holds its breath. Is there any chance Shaw could possibly have lived through the disaster? Southern Pacific train 7551 East has crashed into San Bernardino, California. Four people are dead, and an entire neighborhood has been evacuated. A gas pipeline under the wreck hasn't been checked yet. Chris Shaw was in one of the houses destroyed when the train derailed. 12 hours later, he's still missing. George Avery, a firefighter for less than a year, takes his shift at the crash site. We were ordered to relieve the crews that were trying to search for a body. And at that time, they thought it was a body recovery. Shaw is the last person in the neighborhood still to be accounted for. Workers ask his mother to draw a map of the house. She tells them her son was in the bathroom when the train derailed. Workers concentrate their final search effort there. There's pieces of the house itself sticking out of this big potash mound. So you have studs and rafters and roof covering. So they gave me a specific area, so I started removing the product. And as I did so for, it seemed like an eternity, but it was probably an hour, hour and a half, this void occurred and started to uh, reveal itself in front of me. As Avery reaches into the opening, he feels something snag his jacket. So then I immediately pulled it out, thinking it was caught on a nail or whatever. As I pulled it out and looked inside, I saw this hand waving in front. I found him! I found him! Help! Somebody help me! It takes workers nearly an hour and a half to pull Chris from the wreckage. Debris from the train had formed a protective cocoon around him. It gave Shaw air to breathe and kept the jagged metal from crushing him. We were absolutely amazed that he lived, especially that long. We're talking about most of the day. Really didn't think he had much of a chance, so when he came up out of there, it was just stunning. With Shaw's rescue, Everyone in the neighborhood and on the train has been found. The wreck of 7551 East has killed four people, injured four more, and totally destroyed seven houses. Even with Shaw's rescue, San Bernardino's troubles aren't over yet. 
If the Kalnev pipeline has been damaged, it could explode at any time, destroying more homes and taking more lives. With that threat hanging over the neighborhood, the search for the cause of the derailment begins. William Pugh and Russell Quimby are with the National Transportation Safety Board. By the time the team got there, it was fairly late and it was dark, and uh, the scene looked like Dante's Inferno. A lot of wreckage, a lot of parts still, uh, particularly the brake parts, wheels, red hot still after 12 hours. Wheels had gotten so hot, they'd literally uh, expanded off the axles. The friction between the wheels, the brakes, and the tracks was so intense that the wheels themselves began to liquefy, turning to molten steel as the train sped down the hill. Investigators know the train's brakes couldn't slow it down, but why? The next day, cleanup operations begin. Southern Pacific needs to clear its ruined train from the area. It's the only way investigators can work and Kalnev can check its pipeline. Southern Pacific has all of the cars moved two days later, but the ground is still covered with 7551 East's cargo, hundreds of tons of Trona. Kalnev begins clearing the Trona along the route of the pipeline. It's the quickest way to inspect the line and it keeps the heavy equipment away. They made five or six excavations down to the pipeline to uh, visually look at the pipeline. They felt comfortable that nothing had penetrated to the depth of the pipeline. The fuel is under incredible pressure. Any damage could lead to a massive leak and possible explosion. But Kalnev finds nothing. The depth of the pipe has shielded it from the storm above. The pipeline is a vital source of gas for Las Vegas, almost 320 kilometers away. It supplies both civilian and military customers in the desert. There's pressure to get the gas moving again. There were a number of people in the community that thought it should not be open. And supposedly, people in Las Vegas had said that they had cars that were worth more than our homes on Duffy Street, and so fire up the pipeline. Just four days after the derailment, the pipeline is restarted. Kalnev watches for any drop in pressure. It would mean fuel was escaping, that there was a leak somewhere in the system. But it holds. The very same day, Southern Pacific finishes its repairs on the damaged railway. Trains are once again moving past San Bernardino. The cleanup isn't quite finished, though. More of the ash-like cargo of train 7551 East is littered across the area. Heavy machinery comes in to dig it up and haul it away. The huge machines could easily damage the pipeline, so it's carefully marked with stakes. I told my husband one evening that I smelled gas, but we had been reassured that they had inspected this line and that there were no leaks. I was at the accident site until it was finally cleaned up and there was a fence put around the area and secured. And it looked like everything was fine. Early morning, May the 25th. It's been almost two weeks since 7551 East derailed, slamming into San Bernardino. But the cleanup was fast. For more than a week, the trains and the fuel in a pipeline below have been running smoothly. Then, from a clear sky, rain seems to fall. Large sections of the neighborhood are soaked by this peculiar shower. 
Ruth Green is back in her house when... For the second time in a month, she's confronted with a horrifying sight. To the left of me, as far as I could see up, down, or side to side, was nothing but a big wall of fire. I got to the front door. Neighbors were screaming, get out, get out. I ran for my life. Once again, the fire department responds to a major disaster on Duffy Street. As we're getting the call and getting on the rig and opening the door, there was no doubt in my mind what that was. You could see a huge column of smoke and flame, and I knew immediately it had to be the pipeline. A tower of smoke and flame reaches more than 100 meters into the sky. Initially, when we got in there, we were so close that the plastic lenses on the front of the engine melted. Several of the turn signals, uh, part of the uh, red lights melted. There is an intense noise coming from this pipeline where it ruptured. It sounded like a jet engine. Deafening is how I would describe it. And uh, we dealt with that all day long. Local firefighters aren't the only ones called back to the scene. I got a call to report to the chairman's office. I went down to the chairman's office, notified that the pipeline blew up and that I should get my team together again. The area looked more or less like a war zone, where a lot of damage, a lot of fire damage had been done. Uh, uh, houses in the area were uh, incinerated. Once again, Kalnev, which runs the pipeline, can't shut its emergency valves. Almost two million liters of fuel burn for more than seven hours. By the time the flames are out, Two people are dead. Three more are injured. Another 11 houses have been destroyed. The residents of San Bernardino are in shock. They talked about the fact that one of the people that died, that all they really could find was their shoes that were left in one spot. And, and that, you know, the mental picture of that, it troubles you quite a bit. After the fire, it, it was over for me. I just, I couldn't see myself living in the house anymore. It really scared me just that bad. What people here will soon learn is that all of the damage, pain, and suffering is the result of a simple, horrifying mistake. A small neighborhood in San Bernardino, California, has been devastated by two disasters. In just 13 days, a train derailment and a gas explosion have ripped through the area, killing six people. Investigators with the National Transportation Safety Board study both accidents. With the train crash, they focus on black boxes, which were recovered from three of the engines. And that records uh, distance, speed, uh, throttle position, air brake pressures, uh, that we tried to figure out what speed the train eventually got to. It exceeded the graph. The black boxes reveal that 7551 East had probably reached the incredible speed of 177 kilometers per hour before derailing. The speed limit on the curve was just over 60 kilometers an hour. Although the train's brakes had been applied, it continued accelerating. Ah! How had the train become so out of control? Almost all accidents are a chain of events that link together to cause the accident. Of course, any one point, if you'd broken that link, you know, the accident wouldn't have occurred. Like other freight trains, 7551 East has two different systems to slow it down. Dynamic brakes and air brakes. Air brakes push a block against the wheels of each freight car. The greater the pressure applied to the block, the slower the train goes. Investigators learned that the air brakes were working properly as the train started down the hill. 
As the train sped up, though, engineer Frank Holland maintained pressure on the air brakes. The heat created by the brakes became so intense that they melted. By the time of the crash, they were useless. The team turns its focus to the dynamic brakes. The dynamic brakes harness a magnetic field created by the engine's main generator. They reverse the magnetic field, which slows the axles on the locomotive. There were four engines at the front of the train, and two at the back. Before beginning his trip, engineer Frank Holland knew that his second engine wasn't working at all, and that the dynamic brakes on his fourth engine were only working sporadically. Still, it was more than enough. We figured that with the units that we had on the head end and the two helpers that they gave us later on, we could do 30 miles an hour down that grade with no problem. When his train starts down the mountain, Holland has it under control. With the brakes he has, he should be able to hold his speed, but he can't. Frank, we're at 30. It should be at 25. It's creeping. What the NTSB investigators discover from the black boxes is stunning. The brakes on the third engine at the front of the train didn't work at all as 7551 East gathered speed. During the trip, Holland had even checked with the brake man in the third engine. Alan. Yeah? Well, what are your dynamics like? They're revving. But the black boxes show investigators that even though the dynamic brakes were making the noise they usually make, they weren't working. They weren't helping slow the train down at all. But it gets worse. Coupled and ready to go. Roger of the two engines added to the back of the train, one didn't have any braking power either. Lawrence Hill, the engineer at the back, knew it, but he never told Frank Holland. He didn't communicate to him that he had only one locomotive at a dynamic, the other one was out. The helper engineer thought that the dispatcher would notify the lead engineer. Call in the helper. This is the helper. You got all your dynamics? Yeah, I'm in full. So when Holland asks Hill at the back of the train if he has all of his dynamics, Hill says yes. But he only means in the one engine. It's a startling discovery. Holland doesn't have anywhere near the braking power he thinks he does. Investigators studying the black boxes uncover one more secret of the train's terrifying ride down the mountain. Something must be wrong up there. When Lawrence Hill pulled the emergency brakes, he actually cancelled out the dynamic brakes. It's a safety feature to keep the wheels from locking and the train from sliding down the tracks. In this case, with the air brakes melting, the dynamic brakes were the only thing holding the train back. Putting the emergency brakes on actually sped the train up. When the emergency brakes are applied, what happens is you lose your dynamic braking and you've got a runaway train now. But Pew is still puzzled. According to all the paperwork, 7551 East was hauling three and a half million kilos of cargo. At that weight, even with his crippled engines, Holland should have been able to hold his speed going down the mountain. To find out why he couldn't, investigators turned their attention to the days before the accident. Seven five five one East was pulling a shipment for Lake Minerals. Five days before the trip began, the company's superintendent drops off the proper paperwork with Thomas Blair, who works for Southern Pacific. The paperwork outlines what's in the shipment and, normally, how much it weighs. Thanks. In this case, though, the weight was not filled in. Lake Minerals believed each of the cars was filled to its maximum, 90,000 kilos. Hey! Hey! 
Since that's what the company expected, Lake Minerals didn't think there was any reason to put the number down. But Blair knows that to fill out the proper computer forms, he'll need to have a wait, or the train won't be able to leave the train yard. Blair has been working with Southern Pacific for 17 years. He's seen thousands of freight cars leave his yard. He makes an educated guess that the material in each car on the train weighs 54,000 kilos. But Blair's guess is a tragic miscalculation. Every single freight car on 7551 East is actually carrying 36,000 kilos more material than he estimated. Across 69 cars, it means that the train is actually more than six jumbo jets, two and a half million kilos heavier than anyone thinks it is. Nobody caught the fact that the weights were way under. Train orders, train list, stand, tonnage profile. From then on, uh, the engineer had a profile of the train that showed 6,100 tons. Can I be back in three? Okay. He operated that way, and it was wrong. It was dramatically wrong. I mean, that was only two-thirds of the weight of that train. That train was doomed, and we just didn't know it. Frank Holland was in trouble before his trip began. Even if all of his engines were working, it would have been a difficult trip down the mountain. With all the problems he had, he simply didn't have the power to slow his enormous train down. Crashing into San Bernardino was all but inevitable from the beginning. The wreck of 7551 East was a preventable disaster. Investigators are about to discover that the explosion which followed didn't have to happen either. In May of 1989, twin disasters shatter the town of San Bernardino, California. A train derailment and a gas line explosion kill six people and destroy more than a dozen houses. Investigators comb through the ashes to learn how the two events are linked. The pipeline was two meters below ground. And in the days after the derailment, Calnev examined it closely. They couldn't find a single dent or crack where the train had broken through the earth. The train crash hadn't seemed to weaken the pipeline. And when gas began pumping through the pipe, there was no loss of pressure, no warning sign of a problem. They started operating and brought it up to about uh, 1,600 pounds, and all of the pressure readings at various places along the pipeline looked normal. Since the derailment itself didn't cause the rupture, investigators continue their search. They study the pipeline for clues. Even though the fire burned for hours, the piece of pipe that burst has not been destroyed. When the pipe opened up, it uh, caused a rupture in the pipe that was sort of what we term as a fish mouth shape and at the widest area, it was about four inches wide, and it was about uh, two and a half feet long. Like forensic investigators, the NTSB looks for a telltale fingerprint that will help them discover how the pipe broke. Near the spot where the pipe ruptured, investigators find dents and several deeper gouges. The marks are like wounds on a murder victim. If investigators can find out what caused the marks, they'll discover what caused the pipeline to burst. We knew that it, uh, there were deposits of uh, hardened steel left in the gouges. We knew that whatever piece of equipment had damaged the pipe had teeth on it that were, were uh, hardened steel. There are several possible suspects. A number of front-end loaders and one large backhoe used during the cleanup all had hardened steel teeth. But Batten can never pinpoint the blame. Well, the NTSB determined that the damage to the pipeline was done during one of two phases, either the cleanup of the train wreckage or it was done during the time in which the trona was being cleaned up after the train wreckage had been removed. 
Two mistakes resulted in a pair of disasters for San Bernardino and the death of six people. In its final report on the disasters, the NTSB doesn't blame Frank Holland, saying his belief that he had enough braking power to stop the train was perfectly reasonable. Holland still rides the rails, but he's never made the trip down the San Gabriel Mountains again. Psychologically, I just don't think I could take it. I don't think I could relive that. Every time I went down, I would relive it. And uh, I, I choose not to do that. It would just be too painful. Calnev, the company that operated the pipeline, was called to account for not checking it after the cleanup operations were completed. Lawsuits against the company were settled out of court. Calnev in hindsight, I think would agree that uh, they should have been much more thorough in their inspection. They got comfortable with what they saw, and they made an assessment without adequate information that it was an undamaged pipeline and okay to operate. Thomas Blair, who incorrectly filled in the paperwork, was never charged. But after the disaster, Southern Pacific changed its rules so that every freight car without a specified weight was assumed to be carrying its maximum allowable load. Southern Pacific also settled a number of lawsuits out of court. The company no longer exists. It was bought out years after the disaster. Trains continue to run past San Bernardino, but many of the families involved in the disaster moved away. Trains were still coming down out of Cajon Pass. And so a person couldn't help but go in their mind, go to where, what if that this thing could happen again? Houses aren't allowed beside the tracks anymore. All that's left is an ugly scar of land. An enormous freight train is out of control, tearing through the Canadian Rockies. The crew does nothing to slow the train's terrifying speed. Jack, are you there? Charging the other way, a passenger train with more than 100 people on board. It's one of the most spectacular train rides in the world. Every year, thousands of people take the slow and easy way through Canada's Rocky Mountains. Avoiding traffic, they take the train and leave the driving to somebody else. In late winter, 1986, a gentle trip through the Rockies will end tragically. It was like a mini atom bomb. And all of a sudden, it ignited. Woof. I'm going to help you. I can hear the women screaming, you know, um, to save her baby. An investigation makes shocking discoveries about the Canadian railroad industry. At that time, I didn't think that anything was wrong. February the 8th, 1986. Spectacular northern lights dance across the sky over Edson, Alberta in Western Canada.
Driving freight trains has been a lifelong dream for 48-year-old Canadian National Railways engineer Jack Hudson. But after 16 years on the job, he knows all too well that it can be a grueling career. Because Canadian freight trains travel such vast distances, up to 12 local crews may be used in the course of one cross-country journey. Hudson works a mountainous stretch of track through Alberta, running between his hometown of Jasper and Edson to the east. Like many trainmen, Hudson works a regular beat, driving over the same stretch of track, then turning around again with another train, day after day. At around 11 p.m. last night, Hudson got off the freight train from Jasper and spent the night here in the company bunkhouse at Edson. Now he's up again after just three and a half hours of sleep, ready to return to Jasper. At the station, he's joined by his brakeman, like Hudson, 25-year-old Mark Edwards lives in Jasper. And like Hudson, he hasn't slept very much. Did you get some rest? Not much. Got a touch of the flu. Could use a full night's sleep. <laughs> Hudson and Edwards will ride up front in the first engine. Hudson drives the train while Edwards keeps an eye on the brakes and pitches in if Hudson needs any help. Known to his fellow railmen as Smitty, 33-year-old Wayne Smith is Hudson's conductor. He's the last of the three-man crew in charge of the freight train this morning. Smitty? Smith rides in the caboose, the last car in the train. He acts as an extra set of eyes, making sure the men in the front end know what's going on behind them. The three men are longtime employees of Canadian National, or CN, rail and all of them have been up and down this length of track countless times before. The train they're riding today is enormous. CN train 413 is just under two kilometers long. The cars are filled with a collection of grain, metal pipes and chemicals. It tips the scales at more than 11 million kilos. As the freighter rolls into Edson, it slows to a crawl but doesn't stop. Getting it started again would take time, and the crew wants their trip to begin as soon as possible. Hudson and Edwards take the train on the fly, boarding it as it rolls slowly along. According to CN Rail's code of conduct, this is illegal, but it's something crews do routinely. With the caboose still nearly two kilometers away, Smith stands by the track to inspect the cargo as it crawls by. He makes sure there's nothing obviously wrong with the freight or the cars carrying it. All set, Jack. Clear signal leaving Edson. Clear signal leaving Edson. Another part of Smith's job is to stay in touch with the front end of the train. He's supposed to make sure they're alert throughout the journey. Now, with the caboose pulling alongside the platform, Smith climbs aboard. Okay, he's got the brakes off. You're good to go. See you later. At 6.40 a.m., Hudson pushes the throttle. The freight train picks up speed as its 8,000 horsepower diesel engines open up. The CN freight train begins the long haul west to Jasper. The men are going home. Dispatcher to 413. Good morning, dispatcher. Good morning, Jack. But Hudson isn't sure exactly how long his train is or precisely what he's carrying. Manager at Medicine Lodge here. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, that's, uh, you got pretty well all grain cars, eh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, this should be the right lamp then. Okay, okay, thanks. As 413 roars west, 
a Via passenger train speeds east on the same track. Via Rail's supercontinental passenger train number four is cruising toward Edmonton, Alberta. More than a hundred passengers are enjoying the spectacular scenery as it cruises through the rugged Canadian Rockies. 36-year-old Jamie Haight is a car assembly operator. He's headed home to Ontario after a two-week visit to his family in Vancouver. It's a very, very small community that you're, you're in close proximity with a lot of people very, very suddenly. And, and so there's a, a lot of people we got to meet and got to, got to interact with. I remember there was a couple of ladies that we that we met over dinner. One was 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 very very pregnant. While some passengers are still sleeping, Haight goes into the day coach to do some reading before breakfast. It's the fourth car in the train. I remember this uh, this lady and she had a, a little boy with her, about three years old or whatever. He was quite in awe. The little child was quite in awe of the scenery. So I sat down on it and I lifted the shade a little bit so I could get some of the daylight coming in and I started to read a pocket novel. Several cars behind Haight is 61-year-old assistant conductor Herbert Timpey. An old hand on the Canadian passenger line, he's been riding this piece of track for seven years. I had to be the assistant conductor and look after the passengers on that train. Next stop, Hinton. The passenger train is pulling into Hinton. The freight train is just about to reach Hargwin Station, 20 kilometers east. Here, the rail line briefly splits into two, so trains can pass each other. 413 will take the upper track, while the passenger train passes below it. As Hudson approaches the split in the tracks, traffic signal lights tell him to slow down. Smitty, you've got an approach limited signal at Hardwin. Next station, Dalehurst, over. At end of 413, approach limited at Hardwin. Next station, Dalehurst, out. These are the last words these men will ever exchange. The dispatcher in Edmonton sets a switch, and 413 is forced onto the upper track. The Via passenger train arrives at Hinton Station at 8.20 a.m. On board, 64-year-old Martin Pedersen settles down to breakfast in the downstairs lounge of the dome car. He's feeling rested after a good night's sleep. A former World War II fighter pilot, Pedersen has a lot of experience with locomotives. Over the course of the war, he blew up 36 enemy trains in France. The night before, Pedersen swapped war stories with another veteran he met on board. 61-year-old Kenneth Cuttle is a former Royal Marine. It was February. I was going to Edmonton to look for another job. Like Pedersen, Cuttle also fought behind enemy lines in World War II. Cuttle and Pedersen are survivors. Uh, let's go upstairs to the dome car, have a look around, see what's happening. The train was pretty comfortable, you know, not many people on board. I said, let's go up to the dome car because it was just coming light and we see lots of things which you might not get another chance to see. We were in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. There are now 115 people on board, but the train will never make it to Edmonton, and the passengers and crew enjoying the early morning trip will soon be fighting for their lives. It's a clear, sunny morning on board a passenger train in Western Canada. Breakfast is being served as the train rolls east through the Canadian Rockies. Just 15 kilometers away, an 11 million kilo freight train, CN413, rumbles down the track towards it. 
With diesel engines still pounding at full throttle, it's pulling 113 rail cars of grain and hazardous material. From the outside, everything looks normal. But what's going on inside the lead engine of 413 is about to become one of the greatest mysteries in Canadian railroad history. Freight trains and passenger trains often travel on the same track. For short sections, the track splits, so trains heading in opposite directions can pass safely. Today, 413 is on the upper branch. Signals tell the freight train to slow, then stop completely. The signals will only turn green again once the passenger train has passed safely by below. Then the freight train can rejoin the main line. But 413 isn't slowing down. It's now heading downhill and it charges through the warning lights. If it doesn't stop soon, it will return to the main line at full speed, straight into the path of the passenger train. Unaware of the bizarre behavior of 413, the passenger train continues east. Martin Pedersen gets his breakfast. Hi. Up ahead, the freighter thunders through the last set of light signals, ignoring three red lights that command it to stop. slams back onto the main line. It's traveling 95 kilometers an hour and weighs more than 11 million kilos. And still it doesn't slow down. Herbert Timpey sits to relax. Ken Cuttle has a clear view of the railway ahead. I got in uh, conversation with an English guy and he had his back to the front and I was looking over his shoulder forward the way the train was going. There was a flickering light in the distance. And not knowing the track layout, I thought, oh, there must be another line, and if it's another train, it's going to go past us, you know? Just as I was reading the pocket novel, one of the girls from the party or group happened to just walk past me. Trains collide like two charging rams at a combined speed of nearly 200 kilometers per hour. Passengers are rocked by one collision after another as 70 freight cars pile into the wreckage. Like an incoming wave, grain cars, long pipes, three foot in diameter, 30 feet in length, you name it. And these were flying through the air like toys. Thrown from the tracks by the force of the collision, one freight car flies through the air, smashing to a stop on the Via train. The whole world seemed to explode. It was like a mini atom bomb. It was a big mushroom of black smoke. Then, everything was dark. They could no longer breathe because everything was filled with smoke. Oh, I'm gonna die. And the third thing that happened was I just resigned myself to that. I've been working about 37 years and uh, on the railroad and I never, never seen anything so bad. The wave of metal, the grain cars, stopped just where the dome car was. 
If it had gone another 30 feet, it would have covered us as well. In the same car, one deck below, Martin Pedersen struggles to escape. But he can barely see what's happening in front of him. The window beside him shattered during impact, filling his eyes with broken glass. Almost two kilometers behind the engine, the caboose of train 413 finally lurches to a stop. Conductor Wayne Smith sees a ball of fire glowing in the distance, but he has no idea how bad the situation is. Front end 413. I think we're in the bush or we're derailed. There is a big explosion up here and we have chemicals on the train, so stay away from it. Stay away from the dangerous goods. But all Smith gets in reply is an ominous silence. Passengers continue to struggle to escape the mangled wreck of their train as the smoke thickens. I was trained well in the Royal Marines to survive and to act spontaneously. There was a window at the back of the dome car and it was all cracked and I just jumped up on the seat, smashed my head through the glass roof and shouted, come on, let's get out. Cuttle and others jump from the car. And I look back, and all of a sudden, it ignited. Woof. Down below in the lounge car, Martin Pedersen also manages to escape. But others aren't so lucky. Many are still trapped in the burning cars, including passenger Jamie Haight. The roof of the coach had been crunched down. I mean, I'd lost my glasses. I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe. And here it was the porter that had been behind the snack bar, had opened up this, this exit way, and he had vamoosed out through it and I took off out behind it, too. Snap out of it. He was in shock. Hey, snap out of it. Hey, buddy, pull it together here. You know, there's people in here, and we got to do something about it, but. Half blind without his glasses, Haight goes back inside, trying to help others out of the wreck. 413 here, dispatcher. Back in the caboose, Smith is talking to the freight train's dispatcher, some 285 kilometers away in Edmonton. Herb Timpey, the assistant conductor on the passenger train, can hear the conversation on his radio and breaks in. Passenger coaches all over the ditch. And get an ambulance. And there's a whole bunch of cars on fire. You get that, dispatcher? We need the fire department here very badly. Some coaches are trapped with passengers inside. They're burning. I don't think the engineers lived through this one. It's a real mess. OK, that's right on the switch at Dalehurst, eh? Yes, I'm going to walk up there and see if I can be of any assistance. What was the signal at Dalehurst when your head-in called it? Uh, pardon me? What was that signal on that signal at Dalehurst? Well, well, I was calling him for the signal at Dalehurst quite a few times, but uh, I, I kept calling him and there was no answer. Well, it should have been read on the panel. Well, he must have ran it then, dispatcher, because I could not get a hold of him. I tried and I tried. Okay, all, all right. <laughs> Back at the head of the passenger train, Jamie Haight tries to save who he can. Are you okay? I'm gonna help you. Haight can hear the screams of men and women trapped in the flames. And I can hear the women that I had dinner with the night before screaming, you know, um, to save her baby. Kate was not able to save the mother and her child. They're out of reach under debris. That was, uh, that was difficult. 
People who were trapped and couldn't get out, screaming, screaming like you've never heard. One guy knew that his wife was trapped and he went back in and died with her. Another woman in the carriage under where we were had most of her leg cut off. James Haight courageously decides to go back inside. <coughs> the fire is a scorching 660 degrees, but Haight tries to save one more life. There was, a, there was a chap right in front of me there, and it was the chap I'd had dinner with the night before. And all of a sudden, the flames came and consumed him. He just just sat up and rubbed his head. And... Because there's nothing more we could do it for him. Anybody in front of me in that coach was dead. For whatever the reasons, it wasn't my time to go then, for whatever the reasons. Wayne Smith is devastated. He can't reach his two friends at the front of the freight train, and he can't understand what happened to cause such an enormous disaster. In Western Canada, a freight train has smashed head-on into a passenger train carrying more than 100 people. In the minutes after the collision, survivors are dragging themselves from the burning wreckage, while others are still trapped inside. One of the girls that had been in the, in the car in the morning, and I looked at her and I said, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, you're... He had no choice but to tell her what happened to her friend in the train. You're, uh, uh, your friend was in the car here. She died trapped in the burning debris. I felt like the worst person in the world because I had to tell her. If I could have taken back that one second in time to not tell her, you know. Royal Canadian Mounted Police Constable Mark Linnell is one of the first to arrive on the scene. I was told there was a train derailment, not a train crash. I mean, there's a double whammy. The RCMP officer came. He could hardly speak. His mouth dropped open and he said, I can't believe what I'm witnessing. It's a horrifying scene. Pictures taken shortly after the crash show utter devastation. I mean, I was, I was just flabbergasted. I just couldn't believe it. And I, instant. That's quite the thing to see. The collision is 18 kilometers from the town of Hinton. It takes emergency crews some 45 minutes to get there. I was in the Marines in England for 14 years. I'd seen a lot, a lot of disasters, man-made disasters, terrorist bombs. And I thought I'd seen it all. There was a lot of blunt force trauma, of course, flying glass, burns. And then I saw what appeared to be two bodies in the restaurant car hugging each other. So we found out later that was a man and wife. And this was one heck of a shock. As Linnell is escorting survivors away from the site, he sees a lone man with a radio coming down the track. How's the, uh, how's the front end doing? Uh, what's your name? It's Smith is about to learn that his colleagues aboard his train are dead. Like what happened? Like, did they make contact with the... We're still under investigation, and there's not a lot I can tell you right now. OK, so they still might be... I mean, I'm really sorry. He'd be distraught and shaken, and his, his train is wrecked, and all these people dead.
The Hinton train disaster is the worst railway accident to strike Canada in 35 years. More than $30 million in property are destroyed, 23 people are dead, and 71 others are severely injured. Wayne Smith is the only surviving crew member of the CN train, the only man who may be able to explain how an 11 million kilo freighter plowed headfirst into an oncoming passenger train. What he knows could be critical to unraveling the cause of the disaster. Two days after the collision, the Alberta government establishes an official commission of inquiry, and the Honorable Mr. Justice René P. Foisy leads the investigation. Judge Foisy is a justice of the Alberta Court of Appeal. It was uh, reasonably simple. I mean, what caused the accident? Uh, but it turned out to be a lot more complicated than that because uh, the, there were no easy answers as to what caused the accident. Freight and passenger trains routinely use the same tracks without incident. What was different this time? Over the next 11 months, Foisy calls on 150 witnesses and specialists to help him find out. I think what has most surprised me is the, the complex procedures, the equipment, um, the overall complexity that, uh, that we have to look at in running a railroad and what goes on in running a railroad. While Conductor Smith recovers from the accident, Foisy gets to work. He begins by studying the signals that should have told the freight train to stop. If they weren't working, the crew on 413 may not have thought they needed to slow down. GN did a, uh, a very in-depth test on the signal system, and it was determined that um, it was performing uh, properly. We went further. We uh, hired our own independent experts to test the system. The switches which operate the signal lights were frozen in position after the accident. Electrical engineer Eugene Couch was hired to read them. Perhaps a mechanical fault in the system had turned them green, telling the freight train to speed through. A fault does not give a positive green light to any, any situation. So if, if there was a fault in any control part of the system, it would have forced everything to go to red, which meant the passenger train would have stopped and would have forced the freight train to stop. If a mechanical problem wasn't the cause, there was a more chilling possibility. Perhaps someone set the freight train lights to green on purpose, causing the two trains to collide. Couch dismissed that idea too. To do that would mean that somebody would have to actually go there and really maliciously you know, change things. And there was no sign of any tampering on, on any mechanisms. Basically, our conclusion, we felt that the system was sound and was safe. Foisy believes the lights were red, but the freight train ignored them. Perhaps another mechanical fault was behind the crash. Well, well I was calling him for the signal at Dalehurst Court. In his statement after the crash, Conductor Wayne Smith told Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers that something was wrong with his radio that morning. Because I could not get a hold of him. I tried and I tried. Maybe the front of the train was having mechanical problems, but they weren't able to get in contact with Smith. Joseph Hebert examines the portable radios the crew used. The first test was with the radio that was on the train that uh, was in the accident at Hinton. The radio performed to specification. But even if the radios themselves were working, there could be another problem. Many CN employees claim there are places along the tracks where radio communication is impossible, so-called dead spots. And it's not a dead spot that's there 365 days out of the year. The possibility Sometimes was also examined and dismissed. Sometimes you can't. Some radios are stronger, some are weaker. The second test done as far as communications between the locomotive and the caboose was done with a, the same type of radio as was used at the time the accident took place. The field test with that type of radio had satisfactory performance. Well, the evidence was uh, pretty clear, and we concluded that, that there were no dead spots. One other possible explanation is examined. 
Natural phenomena, like the northern lights, can also affect radio performance. Um, I'm going to measure a medicine light. Northern lights can build up very high currents and communications lines. Anything even hooked up to a radio could pick it up. My determination of it was that uh, they were not a factor. If the signals were red and the radios were working, why had the train crashed? Foisy examines an ingenious piece of technology, the hotbox detector. Sitting beside the track, hotboxes monitor the temperature of a train's wheels and axles. They also record the speed of trains as they roar by. When Foisy and his advisors examine the hotbox data, they make a telling discovery. When the front of the freight train passed the hotbox detector just after Hargwin, it was traveling a little over 60 kilometers an hour. But by the time the caboose passed it, the train was going more than 74 kilometers an hour. Despite the signals telling it to slow down, the train was speeding up. For the last five miles, we were able to determine that the uh, freight train was going uh, at least 59 miles an hour, perhaps as high as 60 or 61. There were no brake applications before the crash as well. The crew let the train travel too fast. They did not heed signals to stop, and they never applied the brakes. It all points to a train that was out of control. Why there were no brake applications is difficult to understand. With mechanical problems ruled out, Foisy begins to examine the crew of the freight train. Perhaps there's something about engineer Jack Hudson, who was in charge of the train, that could explain what happened that day. As Foisy begins sifting through Hudson's medical records and interviewing his family, he makes a disturbing discovery. A train collision in Western Canada has killed 23 people. Another 71 are injured. The man leading the inquiry into the disaster has ruled out mechanical problems. Judge René Foisy now takes a closer look at Jack Hudson, the 16-year veteran who was driving the freight train. When Foisy and the commission review Hudson's medical files, they're shocked by what they discover. Mr. Hudson was a, was a man who, who was sick. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He had... Um, high blood pressure, which was uh, problematic. He had diabetes. He had a, a pancreatic attack uh, the summer before this accident. He had to wear a colostomy for a number of months. Foisy wonders if this long list of illnesses could somehow have led to the train crash. The engineer, Jack Hudson, uh, had been killed outright in the crash and had severe injuries. So we couldn't determine whether there'd been a catastrophic medical event, whether he'd had a heart attack, for example, or a stroke, which had incapacitated him. But we were able to do toxicology, and there was no alcohol or drugs present. He did have a lot of health problems, and he had some problems at home. Uh, that uh, these problems at home appeared to be on the mend, and uh, that he was not the kind of man who, if he was going to commit suicide, would take uh, 23 people with him and injure another 70, uh, some of them very, very seriously. So we discounted that possibility of a suicide. If it wasn't suicide, if Hudson did have a stroke or heart attack at the controls, why didn't his brakeman, Mark Edwards, take any action? Investigators come up with one plausible answer. Did you get some rest? Not much. Got a touch of the flu. Could use a full night's sleep. Perhaps Edwards had been asleep on the job. Dr. Allison Smiley is an expert on sleep and fatigue. Jack Hudson, he had had at the very most before he went on duty that day, three and a half hours of sleep. And that is if he slept from the last moment somebody saw him till the moment somebody next saw him again, three and a half hours. Brakeman said he had a touch of the flu and he'd had five hours sleep the night before. Wayne Smith uh, similarly had had uh, insufficient sleep about five hours before they collision. 
As the freight train passed the signals telling it to stop, the entire crew may have been fast asleep. You could work at any time of the day. So one day you might start at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, the next day you start uh, at 2 in the afternoon. Their hours were so erratic, they were continually in a jet lag state because their physiology was never sort of fully adjusted to uh, any particular working hours. When it comes to staying alert, train engineers face many challenges, including long rides up and down the same stretch of track. The tracks going by one after the other, it's a very soporific situation to work in and easy to see how somebody, no matter how motivated, could fall asleep. At the time, trains were equipped with safety devices that would automatically stop a train if the engine man died or fell asleep, the so-called dead man's pedal. Basically, the engineer is supposed to keep his foot on the pedal. And while he's, his foot is on the pedal, the train won't stop. If that pedal isn't depressed, uh, then uh, it will, after a number of seconds, give a warning, which is uh, quite audible. And if nothing happens, then it will stop the train. But Foisy discovers that for many trainmen, disabling the dead man's pedal is standard practice. One of the excuses that was given by the, uh, the, the engineers is that uh, to go long distances, having to keep your foot on that pedal was very uncomfortable. And uh, so that they would sometimes uh, put something on the pedal, a lunchbox or something heavy enough to keep it depressed so that they could stretch their legs. Unfortunately, uh, what was happening, this pedal was being depressed for long, long periods of time. But even if Edwards and Hudson had fallen asleep at the front of the train and the dead man's pedal was rigged, conductor Wayne Smith at the back could still have prevented the disaster. Almost two months into the Foisy inquiry, Smith takes the stand. Doctors had kept him from testifying earlier, saying he was too traumatized by the accident. Now, for the first time, investigators will hear Smith reconstruct events on board his train in the moments leading up to the disaster. I was sitting looking out the back of the train from my desk when we uh, passed mile board 169. That's the, uh, that's the landmark that I used to initiate a call to the engineer to ask for the display at the Dalehurst approach signal. At end of 413, what indication do you have at the Dalehurst approach signal 1703 over? The front end of the train is supposed to respond, letting Smith know that they've seen the signal lights telling them to slow down. Head of 413, can you hear me? Over. I, I probably called them three or four times. I, uh, I didn't get a response on my gray radio. There was, uh, there was something wrong with it. What's the indication at signal 1703? Over. It's a surprising piece of testimony. Foisy already knows the radios were working fine. When Smith is asked how fast he thought the train was going before the collision, Foisy gets another surprise. <clears throat> I felt the front end give a light brake application on the caboose. Uh, coming around the curve, I felt we were doing a track speed of about 50 miles an hour or less. But according to the hotbox detectors, the train was traveling almost 16 kilometers an hour over track speed and there was never any application of the brakes. I went to my red radio and I tried to get a hold of them on it. Jack, how's the Dalehurst approach signal 1703? I was calling them on channel one three or four times and there was no answer, so I tried to get a hold of them on different channels. But once again, Smith's testimony doesn't add up. Foisy has heard from other train men who were monitoring their radios in the area that day. No one heard Smith call. Smith says he was still trying to contact Hudson when the end of the train raced past signals telling it to slow down. Jack! As an experienced train man, Smith knows that the next set of lights will likely be a triple red telling the train to stop. He was getting no answer and the train wasn't slowing down. An emergency brake cord was in easy reach, but Smith never pulled it. 
Jack, are you there? With Hudson mysteriously silent, Jack, Smith says he does nothing but continue to call the front end. Front end, Jack, come in. Why in the circumstances that you've described did you not pull the brake? Oh, I, I felt the engineer had the train under control. I felt he, in fact, was doing what was necessary to control the train at that point. I never felt at any point in time that I should pull the emergency brake. At that time, I didn't think that anything was wrong. That's the point I make, Mr. Smith, that when there's a problem with the radio, you've been trained over the years to observe the signals. And it, it would have been the last thing I would have done. He didn't pull the brake, he didn't pull the air, because he felt that it hadn't reached that point. Uh, basically, that was his evidence, and uh, I had a lot of difficulty with that because uh, if if it uh, if that point hadn't been reached, when was it going to be reached, if ever? Smith's contradictory testimony is complete. Judge Foisy is now ready to close his case and lay the blame on those responsible for the disaster. The inquiry into one of the deadliest train crashes in Canada is complete. 23 people were killed when a freight train crashed head-on into a passenger train near Hinton, Alberta. Chief Investigator René Foisy has explored every angle, from technical malfunction to human error. He's now ready to deliver his report on what went wrong that day. In his 205-page report, Foisy parcels out the blame, naming all the key offenders. Foisy writes that the train's engineer, Jack Hudson, failed to observe and obey light signals, commanding him to stop his train before it entered the single track. If Hudson was unable to do his job, brakeman Mark Edwards failed to intervene. He also ignored the light signals and didn't brake the train before it entered the single track. Conductor Wayne Smith was guilty too, he had failed to follow operating rules and pull the emergency brake when he couldn't contact the two men at the front of the train. In a statement to police, he had even suggested that he thought they were sleeping. It said that my head end was asleep. Do you recall making that response, sir? Yes, I do. With so many contradictions in his testimony, Foisy rules that the conductor's evidence is unreliable. I wasn't sure what I... What, ha what had happened, and uh, I went to my back desk, I jumped on from the cupola, and uh, ran for, it seemed like we were just keeping going, there was no immediate stopping, the caboose kept sliding. Instead, Foisy emphasizes that Smith, like Edwards and Hudson, was dangerously to... tired that morning. I just wanted to get home, actually, at the time. But the crew aren't the only ones Foisy blames for the accident. According to the Foisy report, Jack Hudson may well have had a stroke or heart attack before the collision. But CN management had known about Hudson's medical record for years. He managed to accumulate, uh, I think it was 40 or 50 demerits, and at 60, you're fired. But after he got to that level, uh, there were some other infractions which weren't recorded. Foisy also calls attention to the rules that were routinely ignored, such as rigging the dead man's pedal and taking the train on the fly. The conclusion we came to is that there was a, a lot to be desired on the part of CN, um, and that, yes, there was certainly some laxness uh, and some complacency when it came to uh, these areas. Uh, I'll get a measure at Medicine Lodge here. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, that's... Uh... You got pretty well green cars, eh? Yeah, I think so. There is a lesson to be learned here. It's that when you have rules, you obey the rules, and you enforce the rules. Uh, if it becomes too much of a fraternity and of a buddy-buddy system, it gets lax. And problems occur, and this tragedy was one of them. Foisy demands that CN improve its safety equipment recommending that all trains be equipped with reset safety control technology. These systems are much more complicated than a dead man's pedal. 
If constant attention is not paid to the train, alarms sound and the train eventually shuts down. It's equipment which has proved valuable several times since the disaster. There was a study done uh, with CN 10 years after this accident. They found something like 90% of the train engineers saying that they had been woken by the alerting device at least once. In response to Foise's report, CN Rail creates one of the most sophisticated fatigue countermeasures programs in the world. Train men are no longer on call seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Napping is no longer frowned upon. Rest houses have been created and improved and locomotive cabs made more comfortable. For the victims of the Hinton disaster of 1986, changes to Canadian railroading come too late. I still remember the people that were killed in the accident and good friends I had on the railroad. And that's really, it does bother me. It's now, it's uh, 20 years nearly. And I'm still going strong. Very lucky. Yeah, I don't equate it to luck, no. No, that, too much of a tragedy to think about luck. It, too much, there's too much hurt that happened inside of me. It took me quite a while to rebuild my, my sanity again. I got over it fairly quickly and got on with their life. There may be lots of other people who weren't as lucky. You can be going along in life and then something can come along and just kind of destroy your very foundation or shatter your very foundation. And through no fault of your own, but life has a habit of doing that. But the other thing I can share with them is that you can recover from it. There is a tomorrow.